You're looking live at the Crew Dragon spacecraft on top of a Falcon 9 rocket set to launch four astronauts to the International Space Station in a little less than four hours. But right now, they're live inside the room right here. Crew 4 astronauts getting their spacesuits on. And this is a live look inside that suit-up room where the crew of three Americans and one European astronaut are completing their checkouts of their spacesuits. Welcome, everybody, to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for live coverage of NASA and SpaceX's launch of Crew-4. I'm Daryl Nail, and I'm with Megan MacArthur, astronaut from Crew-2. You were the pilot in that mission, so it's great that you have that experience and that you're here to share it with us because you know this mission well, but you also flew the space shuttle. Absolutely. Um, it's always exciting to be at Kennedy Space Center, uh, space Center on a launch day. I'm super excited to see my friends getting ready to fly. They all have big smiles on their faces and it's going to be a great time watching them get ready tonight. Absolutely. And it all started when they woke up today at 8.37 p.m. yesterday because we just rolled over midnight <laughs> into Wednesday, but it was Tuesday just a few hours ago. And that gets everything rolling. That's right. It's uh, We think of the day is starting sort of at launch time, but in fact, they've been up for many hours going through um, some weather briefings, some last minute checks. And as we see them right now, going through the suit checkout um, before they take the next steps to head out toward the rocket. And, so. we'll, and we'll jump back into the room here in just a second to get more of your insight on that. We want to invite you at home who are participating. You, you can participate, really, by or on using the one, hashtag AskNASA. Team is in the white room and we are on schedule. There you'll hear the operational audio. We'll have that playing in the background from time to time. We'll try to make sure our comments are uh, down and low when they talk so you can hear that. Uh, but in addition to Megan's analysis, we also have teams around the country covering all the action, and there you see them now. We'll get updates from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, as well as NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, and of course, right here in Florida. And there's Dan and Jesse mugging for the camera. I appreciate that. And of course, the rocket is on the pad. We'll talk with Crew 3 astronaut Raja Chari, who is in space right now, making preparations for Crew 4. Now let's go back out live. There is the rocket and the spacecraft, and this is the suit-up room, a historic room inside the Operations and Checkout Building, the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at the Kennedy Space Center, where astronauts have been getting ready for launch, going all the way back to Apollo 7, and then in this building, back to Gemini 3. It's a remarkable, it's a great feeling when you walk into the room and you recognize the history that's taken place in that room. Um, visually, it looks, it does look different than when it, uh, when we use the room for shuttle. Not tremendously different because the purpose is still the same. You're still getting into your spacesuit, making sure everything fits where it's supposed to, making sure the suit um, has its pressure integrity checked, and that's what they're going through right now. So this is really kind of the beginning of that buildup of excitement that's going to continue for them throughout the night. Absolutely, and each one of the Crew-4 astronauts is in a seat that is molded exactly as it is in the spacecraft, right? That's right. So the, the cushioning that you see is can be changed out based on the size of each individual astronaut, and the idea is that that seat is going to cradle you through the various dynamic phases of flight. So the, you want it to fit, it, fit you pretty well. And you can see the SpaceX suit techs there with them. Uh, monitoring both on laptops, but then also interacting with the astronauts. Can you believe it, Megan, that you were in that room? 
of just about one year ago. It is. It's hard to believe. In some sense, it feels like it was yesterday, but in other ways, it feels like it was a lifetime ago. Yeah. But watching them go through this now definitely brings back all of those memories and those feelings from being in that room and, and having that excitement build. You can see the, uh, the equipment against the wall, the gray colored equipment with the, the dials and, uh, and the switches and knobs. That's original from uh, the, the shuttle and Apollo era. They left it there as kind of a, an homage to the, the era of past spaceflight. I think that's right. And it, it really does, you know, having been in there before, um, I, I'm definitely a person who appreciates history. Um, and I think it's a nice, like you said, homage to that, the history of that room and the achievements that started, you know, the day started in, in that room. So it's neat to still see that there. Um, the SpaceX team, of course, runs a very efficient process. Um, they've done this now several times, and they'll continue to improve their process and get better as they learn things from every mission. I was thinking it's actually this will be the seventh time that they've launched people on a Crew Dragon. And that may seem like a big number, but in a way, it's actually still quite a small number. So we do expect to continue to learn things every single time we do it. And we are on an increase of that pace, right? right as, absolutely. as it's really starting to pick up, just got that commercial crew back, um, and the private crew uh, that Axiom 1 just came down. Yep. So let's get to know Crew 4 uh, just a little bit more. This is the fourth rotational crew to fly on a commercial spacecraft, and each astronaut brings a diverse set of experiences to today's flight. And that astronaut that you see right there sitting in the chair, let's start with him. That is Dr. Chell Lindgren. He was born in Taipei, Taiwan, but spent most of his childhood overseas in England, which he very much appreciated. You'll hear more from him about that. He was an instructor and jump master with the U.S. Air Force Academy and also has a doctorate in medicine. And he served as a flight surgeon for NASA. After he was chosen as an astronaut, Lindgren flew on Soyuz and spent 141 days in space during Expedition 44 and 45. He has a wife and three children. And today, Megan, he is the commander of Crew Dragon. That's right. He is going to make an outstanding commander. He's a wonderful, talented person, obviously experienced at living and working in space, but also just a really good human. He's going to be looking out for his crewmates. In three hours, 45 minutes. The side hatch is now open, and we are on schedule. And they're very lucky to have him as their leader. Up next is fellow airman Bob Hines. There he is with his visor open, communicating with his suit tech. He was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He has a wife and three daughters. He has a Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering and served 21 years in the U.S. Air Force as a test pilot. He was also a fighter pilot. He flew the F-15E. He came to NASA as a research pilot where he flew science missions in our WB-57. Today, he's going into space for the very first time as the pilot for NASA SpaceX's Crew-4. Megan, you were the pilot for crew two. It's a position you know well. That's right. It's, well, it's an extremely important role, Daryl, <laughs> as I'm sure you know. Of course, um, because you did it. <laughs> uh, I first got to interact actually with Bob um, when he was an instructor pilot for T-38 for the astronaut corps. And so flying with him was always a pleasure. He's always calm and collected no matter what the circumstances, which is exactly the person that you want uh, piloting any vehicle that you're in. And uh, they're going to make a great team today. He did look quite calm in that shot, quite <laughs> steady. This guy has flown so many aircraft, and we'll hear more about that in his bio a little bit later on. Now let's introduce you to the two mission specialists, Jessica Watkins, and there she is, looking calm and collected and not moving very much, but very focused, I imagine. She considers Lafayette, Colorado her hometown, a talented rugby player in college. Her team won the national championship in 2008 when she was with uh, her university, I believe it was Sanford. Um, Watkins was a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology. She completed several internships with NASA, including one testing system designs for the Mars Perseverance mission at JPL. She became an astronaut in 2017, a turtle. We'll talk more about that. And now, just like Bob, she's going into space for the very first time. This is a brand new experience for her. Yep, it's a bit of a turtle takeover, I think, is what we're experiencing uh, on Space Station right now. But Jessica is an outstanding crew member. Um, it's been fun to get to know her since she arrived with her classmates. Um, just tremendous amount of knowledge that she brings. 
um, can be very focused and serious on the task at hand, but uh, boy, when she smiles, it really lights up the room. I think this crew is going to have a lot of fun together. It sure does. And as she motions towards her suit, calling over the suit tech, what, what, is, what, what are you communicating with them about? Um, so it depends a little bit. They're going to be asking you um, how things fit, how they feel, how you can hear, um, if you're having any problems with, um, with the communications system. Um, as well as with the cooling system. So there's a variety of things that they could be checking at this point. The second mission specialist is Samantha Cristoforetti. She was born in Milan, Italy, but now lives in Cologne, Germany with her partner and two children. In 2006, she earned her fighter pilot wings and flew the AMX attack fighter at a base in Italy. In 2013, Cristoforetti launched into space aboard a Soyuz for a long duration space flight to the International Space Station. So. She has quite a bit of experience aboard station. Several years later, she was awarded the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of Merit from the President of Italy. And today, she returns to space and the space station with Crew 4. Another very impressive resume, um, but also a really just a great person to be around. So they're going to really work well together. Um, they've gotten to spend several months together training and getting to know one another. And I think this mix of uh, experience and skills is going to blend really well and make for a successful crew. We've got a couple astronauts standing up and you can see they're still attached um, to a blue box that's sitting there right next to their seat. What is that, Megan? And what, what purpose does it serve? Uh, that blue box is providing a cooling air for them as they're moving around. You do get, um, you do can get quite warm in that suit. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're sort of preemptively making sure that the crew members are not gonna get overheated um, during this wait time. And each of these four crew members will be part of Expedition 67 once they arrive at the International Space Station, getting some final fit checks there for Chell as uh, his suit tech is taking care of it, making sure there's, as you said, Megan, no hot spots. wanna be comfortable uh, when you're getting ready to launch. So now let's check in with our team monitoring preparations for launch at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We're going to NASA's Dan Hewitt and SpaceX's Jesse Anderson. Take it away. Hey, thanks, Daryl. And hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Dan Hewitt. Thrilled to be back here at Hawthorne for another crew launch. Yeah, and I'm Jesse Anderson, a production engineering manager here at SpaceX, and per usual, super excited about Crew 4 today. Welcome to Mission Control in Hawthorne. This is where the teams are staffed around the clock as we count down to liftoff. Now on console or headset in Mission Control are six key positions. The mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making real-time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you'll hear talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resources engineer, which you'll hear us refer to as the core throughout the broadcast. The additional positions are focused on vehicle systems, including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. And NASA has its own team members back in Mission Control Houston. We're going to check in there a little bit later, where they're preparing the space station for Crew Dragon's arrival. And we're going to meet several of those key players when we do check in. Now, today's ride to the space station will take about 22 hours with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if needed. Now, at T minus three hours and 39 minutes until liftoff, let's go to Andy Tran for an update on the launch countdown. How's it going so far, Andy? Things are going good, Jesse. We are coming up on T minus three hours and 30 minutes, and um, things are going well for launch. At T minus four hours, there was a briefing by the SpaceX launch director, and good news, there's really nothing significant to report on the rocket. Everything is re looking really good for tonight. Earlier in the night, the team began clearing the hazard area and buildings around Pad 39A, known as the Blast Danger Area, or BDA. The only people remaining on the pad are the ones needed for ingress of the astronauts, and crew arrival is expected to happen in about an hour. At the launch pad, Falcon 9 is powered on, and we're currently monitoring telemetry and pressurizing gas storage vessels. Engine and stage checkouts were also performed several hours ago. On top of Falcon 9, the Dragon spacecraft is ready for the crew. Functional checkouts were performed, and most recently, the Dragon propellant system was pressurized to final flight pressure about an hour ago. Currently, all spacecraft systems are a go. 
Uh, launch range is also ready to support and working no issues at the time. The weather is cooperating as we continue to count down to liftoff. So again, uh, everything is looking great for tonight's liftoff. Uh, with that, I'm going to send it back over to Daryl and Megan. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. It's now T minus three hours and 37 minutes and counting here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida as we cruise around the desk here. The crew ate breakfast a little after 9 p.m. last night. Medical checks then followed, and then less than an hour ago, they got a weather briefing to make sure they were all good for launch. We heard, uh, I heard from Rob Navius, uh, PAO over at Johnson, that the launch corridor, that corridor, the abort corridor, I should say, weather is good there. And that's a tough one to get because that's a large swath of area. Yes. Now, the, the, we're looking inside the room now at uh, suit up room at astronaut crew quarters, and you can see we're getting ready for a crew walkout. Um, the techs are now finishing up uh, each crew member. They're in their own custom spacesuit inside the historic astronaut crew quarters suit up room. And in a few minutes, at T minus three hours and 25 minutes, the crew will be making their way out of the famed suit up room that we see here. Uh, they'll go down a hallway and into an elevator down to the first floor and then outside to the families where they will be greeted. Uh, by them and their loved ones and a small group of well-wishers. There'll be some media on hand as well before they head out to the pad. You see there in the upper left part of your camera there, uh, a blue flight suit, that's Joe Acaba. He's the chief of the Vehicle Integration Test Office and he's managing the crew schedules and all the crew quarter operations. He's the one keeping them on time in the room, right, Megan? That's right. There's a, well, there's a team of folks that are managing that schedule. He makes sure that the operations for the um, astronaut quarantine facility run smoothly, that everybody has everything they need, um, you know, everything from the air conditioning to the food to, you know, everything in between. He's making sure that runs smoothly for everybody there, um, which is, a, which is a, an important job. And, and, boy, they sure do feed us really well. Um, in that time frame. And right there is Zena Cardman. That's right. Fellow astronaut. Fellow with turtle. And a turtle as well. <laughs> another turtle in there. Yeah. <laughs> she is supporting the astronauts, right? That's She's right. in the support role, wearing, as you notice, the black SpaceX uh, ninja suit, as they call it. Yes. Um, and there's a reason for that. Well, yeah, that's, I think, to, because the, the team is um, kind of one team is the idea, and, uh, and she blends in with the rest of the team. But it is nice for us to have that one NASA representative knowing that, uh, you know, they're holding on to any messages or any information that we need to pass back and forth. So, Megan, you were on both sides of the stanchions when this walkout. Oh, countdown one, we're T minus three hours, 35 minutes. Crew suit donning and checkouts are complete. We're on schedule. Okay, and they look finished and they're all ready to go. And as I was mentioning, um, you were on both sides. So uh, both uh, on the inside as an astronaut for crew two, but then also on the outside for your husband, Bob Benkin, who along with Doug Hurley flew that historic mission, the first Crew Dragon to go to the International Space Station. That's right, and it's a, it's a different experience with some similarities. You know, as the, as the family member, as the loved ones, you're outside, you're very excited for them to come out. You're thinking about how they're feeling and wanting to give them, you know, a good, bright, joyful send-off. Um, but, of course, as the family member with no active role in the process, it's a little nerve-wracking, right, to realize that this major thing is about to happen that you're not participating in. My focus then was just to make sure that my son was enjoying it, that he was going to get to enjoy seeing his father in this moment um, and celebrate with him and not try to climb into the Tesla on the, on the way to the launch pad. That was my primary goal as Can in my blame? mom role, right? Um, and then on the flip side, when you're the crew member, you know, you know you're going to get to see your family really soon. You're hoping that this is a joyful experience for them, that they're enjoying it, that they're excited for you um, and so you do share those kinds of emotions but I will say it's a much harder job um, as the loved ones that are there kind of being left behind because you don't have that active role mm. in the day's activities you're just kind of a passive bystander so for somebody like myself that's used to being very active that that was a challenge to realize he's doing this all on his own and I can't help no matter what so that was that was my challenge. There are three Teslas, as you can see there. We've uh, been showing you some views right outside the operations and checkout building there. And those are the vehicles that will take the astronauts to the pad, the second two Teslas. 
Uh, they will drive the crew out to Launch Complex 39A. Riding in the first car will be the suit techs and the spacecraft closeout lead. In the second Tesla, Commander Chell Lindgren and pilot Bob Hines will be sharing a ride with a NASA flight surgeon. And in the third vehicle will be Jessica Watkins and Samantha Cristoforetti. They'll also have another closeout lead with them in that vehicle. And of course, we will follow the convoy live every step of the way, getting you as close as we can possibly get you without actually being inside the car. Now let's take a look at uh, the crew's experiences bonding together. I think one of the most special things about this particular space flight are the people that I get to fly with. Bob Hines, or Farmer, is a test pilot. He is the, the pilot for our spacecraft. Samantha Cristoforetti is an Italian fighter pilot who flew in uh, 2014. And Jessica Watkins is one of our newer astronauts. She is somebody that absolutely is foundational to our crew and somebody that can be counted on. Chell is our fearless leader, always in command, ready for the next move, and just somebody that I deeply respect. I knew Chell Lindgren, our commander, very well. He was on the backup crew of my first flight, so we spent quite some time together. So I felt very grateful because Chell is just a great guy. <laughs> a little known fact about Jessica Watkins is that she has the sixth sense to know whenever something is in free flight around her and catch it. Uh, so I am really interested to see how in zero gravity where everything's in free flight, I really want to see how she uh, manages that. She is phenomenal. You know, she joined our crew a little bit late and for our very first SpaceX sim, she jumped right in there as if she had been training with us for months. Samantha Christopher Reddy is an Italian ISA astronaut. She always brings the Italian culture and energy to the table, always super inquisitive, um, and just makes us all feel like family. To see her experience and the expertise that she brings um, and her leadership has been very special. And Bob Hines, or Farmer, is a test pilot. He is the, the pilot for our spacecraft. It's uh, such a privilege to get to work with him and to lean on his flying and test pilot experience. He will always bring a dad joke. Uh, so you can always be prepared for that. When we're in space, we 100% put our lives in the hands of our crewmates. All four of us together uh, really come together and balance each other out and um, really just coalesce well as a crew. Incredibly happy and thought I couldn't have had a better crew. Well, you love to hear how they bond, you know, over the two years of training. I'm sure it was the same for your crew as well. It's the best part of the mission, really, is that How bonding? about that? Yeah. Well, this is the Operations and Checkout Building, high above from our helicopter here at Kennedy Space Center. And inside is some beautiful artwork. Megan, this is some artwork that came to us from around the world, part of the 2022 Children's International Artwork Contest winners, ages four through six. Love and I, I love this. They've done such a great job, great job uh, putting uh, these little paintings together. They were in categories, as you can see. Some were spacecraft, some were exploring the solar system. I love the one in the bottom left-hand corner. You see that, living and working in space? <laughs> yes. It's got a space station, and it's tethered to the Earth. <laughs> okay, yeah. They're, they're living in their own world there. Maybe, maybe one day we can have plants and trees like that one. Thank you to all the children who participated in our art contest. It is up on the wall, and the astronauts of Crew 4 will be walking by, and they'll see that art Very as they cool. walk right by. Th throughout uh, the mission, we want to invite you for the next three and a half hours to send us your questions for Megan. We've got the expert on hand. All you have to do is use the hashtag AskNASA handle on Twitter. So tweet it at us and uh, we'll get some of those questions on the air and ask to her. We got a question right now, in fact. All right. From Go for Space Launch. Megan, how many people can live and work on the space station at one time? That's a great question. So when I arrived aboard the International Space Station, there was already Crew 1 was there, as well as a Soyuz crew. So in total, there were 11 of us on board the International Space Station at that time. Um, 
the space station is large, but that does make it a little crowded. It makes it a little crowded for some of the um, hardware that you need to use, for example, the toilet or the, the galley to prepare okay. your food. And so um, it impedes our ability to work effectively when there's that many people on board, mm. but we all live there safely and, and we are teaching one another, you know, we call it handover to learn how to operate the space station. It takes more coordination and more planning and organization. Exactly. The size of space station is roughly like I heard it described as a five bedroom house. I mean, outside it's as large as a football field. Right. It is massive. Right. Orbiting around our earth. On the inside, five bedroom house. Yes, so the living space inside is smaller than the overall size of the space station. There's a lot of external structure on the space station that, it, you know, the truss that holds a lot of our equipment, uh, power generation and distribution equipment, for example. Mm. Um, and we don't, those are not pressurized living spaces, but they are still part of the structure of space station. So the living space inside five bedroom house is a closer, um, a closer number. Okay, very good. And about 6,000 square feet is what I heard as well. We have another social question as we are live outside of the crew quarters waiting for astronaut, uh, the astronauts from Crew 4 to walk out. Uh, what are some of the manual features on the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule? And that comes from William 46617-13744. So the manual features are designed um, in the event, because the vehicle is designed to be largely automated and ground controlled. So the manual features are designed in the event that the crew has to take over or has to take care of themselves in some way. So we think about manual manual flying as a capability that we have close into the space station, should that become necessary. Um, we don't expect that to ever become necessary, but it was tested out on the, uh, on the original demo mission. And as the pilot, that was something that you had to know well. We had to train, Shane and I trained that together. Um, and in the event, for example, that we had a, an unsuccessful docking, we would have to make sure that the vehicle was departing the space station appropriately and safely. And if it wasn't, then there was some manual control that we would take and, and do some maneuvering with the spacecraft. But fortunately, we never had to do that. But that's an example of the kinds of things that we can do manually on space. Uh, Great capability. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's autopiloted. Uh, if nothing goes wrong, but you want that ability to jump in and take it. Great question. Keep them coming. We've got another one here. Jet for me asks, what's the launch trajectory and visibility for the Crew 4 launch? Now, this is a little bit more of a complicated question dealing with the trajectory of this particular launch. It's the same as it was for you, where we're going up and out over the Atlantic seaboard. Right. So. I didn't get to see the last one like this, but I would imagine that it's going to be a spectacular view for those in the local area uh, because it's a night launch and uh, hopefully the lighting conditions will be similar and that you can see the, the trajectory for quite, quite some way as it flies up along the Atlantic coast. Especially at night with the brightness that this exactly, rocket yeah. gives off. And as we look live here at uh, one of the Teslas and uh, members of the media and family members gathering, you can see in the, in the left hand side. Administrator Bill Nelson, NASA's administrator, former Florida senator uh, here in the state of Florida. And next to him is Bob Cabana, the former uh, director of the Kennedy Space Center and current associate administrator uh, working out of headquarters now, uh, helping Administrator Nelson lead the agency. See Kelvin Manning as well to his right. And here comes Crew 4 down the hallway. All right. On the left, Bob Hines. On the right, Jell Lindgren, giving a good wave. Look at those smiles. Great smiles. Jessica Watkins and Samantha Cristoforetti. And Bear in the ele elevator they go. Look at all those signatures, Megan. You can see them on the wall. Folks who have supported this program. Yes, I remember that when we got into the elevator. And it's such a good feeling. Um, we don't often get to interact with the thousands and thousands of people that make it possible. And it's so nice to see that. Um, just tangible evidence that they're thinking of us. And it you know, reminds us, of course, we all are always thinking of them too, but it's a nice reminder of how large and how dedicated this team is. Got the elevator closed and now they're on their way down from uh, the fourth floor to the, to the first floor. And uh, we are just now moments away as a result from seeing the crew four astronauts exit the operations and check out building. Yeah, so excitement is building. I remember waiting inside, you know, you get down off the elevator and then everything is timed very precisely. So you get, you wait for just a couple moments and then the SpaceX team will give you the cue to, to start walking out and that excitement builds pretty quickly. And since you speak of that, Megan, we want to give you a little flashback. Take a look at the screen <laughs> now. You might remember this. 
demo <laughs> two. And there you are in the light blue yep. with your son saying goodbye to your husband, Bob Bacon, on that historic flight. That's right. That was a really special moment. And uh, it was great to see how excited my son was to see his father. There were no tears. It was all smiles and cheering. Uh, my son, I think, was determined to say, launch America first and loudest. And so that's uh, that's what he was doing. He did a great job. And then in April, Crew 2, this was your launch. And yes. now the role was reversed. You were in the astronaut suit getting ready to go out and launch. And your husband was there with your son. That's right. And I was listening out for that for that launch America. And I, <laughs> sure enough, I could hear it from probably 20 feet away. Um, that was a wonderful moment. And now we look at the doors for Crew 4 awaiting their moment with their families before they go out to launch pad 39A, a historic pad here where their rocket awaits them as well as their spacecraft, the Crew Dragon Freedom. Usually when the first SpaceX tech comes out, the astronauts are not far behind. You can see on the top there the NASA meatball, the logo, and the various mission patches around it. Those have been put there by previous crews. That's right. Uh, you can actually just barely see the meatball. It's almost completely covered with, <laughs> with, <laughs> yeah. um, with mission stickers, but that's an important part of the traditions as well. The gull wing doors of the Teslas now opening. There we are. At T minus three hours and 21 minutes until liftoff. You can see the markings on the ground. The family will not go beyond that rope and the astronauts will generally stay behind the yellow. But then there will be a moment, as we saw uh, from previous videos, where the family will get to go up to the car. Yes, once the windows, once the doors are closed and the windows are up, you're allowed to go up and, and look through the glass a little bit closer, which is nice. I was, there they there are. There they are. <laughs> the astronauts of Crew 4 getting ready to go to space, taking their first steps up outside. From left to right, Jessica Watkins. Bob Hines, Jell Lindgren, and Samantha Cristoforetti. Oh, what do we got here? One, two, three, four! Nice. <laughs> and a cheer before they go off to space. I like the huddle. That was a nice little touch. Very nice, yes. Oh, you're going to KLR. And here's that moment, maybe. It's a wonderful moment, just seeing the smiles on the faces of your loved ones, knowing that they're there for you, that they're excited for you. It's really special. Oh, seriously? Wow. That's hard to do on command. We'll listen in for... Some of the comments. Maybe we'll get to hear Chell's big booming laugh one more time. After this, after I get in the car, I think you guys are going to get to the car. It's going to be good. You got big smiles all the way around. I remember you smiling quite a bit as well, Megan. <laughs> and then you told me there was a reason. Oh, were you watching that? That um, you wanted to send the message. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, again, you're not really sure how your family members will react, especially if you have young children. And so the main thing is to just show them that it's a joyful occasion, it's something to be excited and happy about. Um, my hope was to, you know, head off any tears that might be coming or, you know, any upset feelings. But really, um, my son ended up just being a trooper. He was so happy. There was so much excitement around him that that really helped buoy him up, I think, for both circumstances. And I was so grateful to see that. 
And didn't he break free and say like, hey, mommy, I love you? <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds right. I was worried he was going to actually come through the ropes, but, uh, but he did not do that. Um, I think for Bob's launch, there's an image of him like actually trying to get through the window um, before the vehicles drove away, but I managed right. to hold on to him. <laughs> he was a little bit smaller then. One of our astronauts really soaking it in. I believe that's Joe. Yeah, I don't want to miss that picture, that perfect photo. Mm. That does look like he's posing. Right. And the guys. wave. Oh, thank you guys. Great shot thank there you. from our hey, sir. How are you? helicopter over that? above. I think that's maybe that's Farmer. Sounds oh, like is that it. Bob Hines? I think so. Yes, you're right. That shot from above was actually from one of our photographers, not the helicopter, one correct that. That is our helicopter shot. Hey, Kat. Okay, doors closing. Our helicopter will follow the entire way as the convoy pulls out. You can see the SWAT vehicle in the background, and now the families and loved ones come in. Yes, they get that up close view one more time with their loved ones, um, and that's really special. Any last um, little messages you want to share privately or just uh, hands up against the glass, it's a special moment. And Megan, the plate for uh, on every car of the Tesla is go for launch. <laughs> As we can see, the custom uh, plate, this has become a tradition yeah, I like uh, to it. do uh, on, the, uh, on the ride out to the launch pad. It's a nice touch. As they get ready to pull out there, I'm, I'm wondering, Megan, is there a little bit of a conflict for the astronauts seeing your loved ones, knowing you are getting ready to do something that involves risk? Right. It's something that obviously you're not thinking about it for the first time at that moment, but it's certainly present in your mind. It's something that you ideally have talked about with your family in the months and weeks even years really leading up to making a decision like this and um, you know depending on the age of your family members you do it in an age appropriate way and so for us we wanted to make sure our son had had a chance to watch a rocket launch with both of us present so we took him to an uncrewed cargo launch when he was uh, maybe three or four and then you know kind of a build-up approach for him and uh, you know introduced it to him gradually so that he could get comfortable with the idea and uh, you know at first when I told him I was going um, he said, absolutely not. <laughs> You're not going. And then he said, okay, you can go, but 180 days is, is much too long. So it's, it's not really a negotiation, but it's a sort of a gradual introduction of what it is. And then you try to share, obviously, why you believe it's important to do these things, even though they're risky and that they benefit mankind, they benefit all of us. And there goes our convoy rolling out to the launch pad. The last 10 miles, a 20 minute drive, they won't see much in the dark, but this is the way to space. Yes. This is a nice relaxation moment. You've just gone through a happy scene, hopefully, but an emotional scene nonetheless. And this is a little bit of a time to kind of lean back in your chair a little bit. Um, for me, it was blaring some favorite songs. Um, and at nighttime, that was fun just because of the, you know, the darkness and then the different lights that you see. It was kind of a neat visual experience but it's just a time for a little bit of relaxation before the next phase of the journey. And now we begin the 20 minute drive with a full security escort across NASA's Kennedy Space Center and out to launch pad 39A. And as we follow the convoy, we'd like to take a closer look at the crew four spacecraft commander and the rest of the astronauts in this convoy, help you get to know them a little bit. And we'll start off with NASA astronaut, Chell Lindgren. Why do we explore? You know, I think venturing out into low Earth orbit and beyond helps us to better understand who we are and our place in the solar system and the universe. My name is Chell Lundgren, and I'm the commander for NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station. I grew up in an Air Force family, and so I was born in Taiwan and spent the first two years of my life there. We lived in Kansas and Illinois, 
And then we were transferred to England. It was a phenomenal uh, upbringing. The opportunity to experience different cultures, it really opened my eyes to what it means to be an American. I have wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember. I think I was inspired by the very first space shuttle launch in April of 1981. And that, I think, is really when this, this dream was, was uh, just burned into my consciousness. And so I chartered out a path. I went to the Air Force Academy, maybe to become a test pilot and then ultimately to join NASA as an astronaut. That path took some twists and curves, and I ultimately did not become a pilot, but uh, went into medicine. And yet, still found a path through medicine where I could serve human spaceflight as a flight surgeon uh, at NASA, supporting our crews training for International Space Station missions. But I still had that dream that, that perhaps um, I would get to do that job someday. It was absolutely amazing to get the call that uh, I had been selected into the astronaut office and it felt a little bit like a culmination of the hard work that I had invested in getting to that point. What an amazing, really dream come true for me. In 2013, I was assigned to my first mission and spent 141 days living and working on the International Space Station. That truly was the realization of that lifelong dream of all of those things in that moment and in that mission uh, were really, really special. It was an absolute honor to get selected for the Crew 4 mission. And on top of that, to have the opportunity to command. Getting to fly with this amazing crew, with Farmer and Samantha and Wadi, they are incredible astronauts. And I feel very grateful to be on a team with them. But we're one small part of a larger team that spans the nation and the world. Uh, we truly get to leverage the best and brightest as we chase somewhat impossible goals. And so as we push forward to the moon, as we push to Mars, we are presenting ourselves with almost insurmountable challenges. By presenting ourselves with those challenges, we become better as a community, as a country, and as a species. story from Chell Lindgren on his path to becoming an astronaut and this is what he's seeing right now Megan you remember this view this is a live camera looking forward from the first Tesla in the rollout you can see the security car ahead of it it's dark but that's NASA Causeway as they roll towards the path that's right you were rocking out at this time. I was, yes. Well, we were taking turns. We each got to choose some songs for the playlist, and I was of the Metallica and Red Hot Chili Peppers variety, and Shane's songs were a little different, but we did overlap in U2 territory, so there was some, there was some crossover. <laughs> Finding some common ground yes. there with the music. <laughs> well, riding with Jell Lindgren is Crew Dragon pilot and NASA astronaut by Bob Hines. Let's listen in to his story. I truly believe that we all have in us an innate desire to go explore and see new things. And we have this phenomenal creation that we've been placed in to learn about how it works. We have a very unique position in our solar system and our galaxy to be able to look out there and to step out and continue to explore. My name is Bob Hines. I'm the pilot for NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina. My father was in the Army. We were stationed at Fort Bragg, and we moved around a whole bunch. The longest we ever lived anywhere was about two to two and a half years. I got really comfortable uh, showing up in new places and being able to make friends. When I was a kid, I 100% wanted to be a pilot for as long as I can remember. I was just always fascinated, not only that something that big could fly and do some amazing things, but also just the opportunity to go and see things that not many people have had a chance to do. Being able to fly and see the Earth from a new perspective has really been just a real driver for me, and getting hired as an astronaut has been the ultimate call. 
Contrary to popular belief, being a test pilot is not about flying by the seat of your pants and going out there and just pushing the edge of the envelope all the time. It is a much more scientific and methodical process where we plan out every mission and all the tasks on every mission and we're constantly mitigating the risks that are associated with that mission. That seems to really dovetail very well with spaceflight because that's a lot of what we do. My experience as a test pilot and as a pilot and an instructor, I think have all kind of led me to this point. When I got the phone call offering me the position of the pilot on the Crew 4 mission, it was absolutely amazing. It was actually the day after my birthday when I got the phone call, and I just couldn't believe it. When I told my wife, she couldn't believe it either. I've flown over 3,500 hours in more than 50 different kinds of airplanes, and that ranges from gliders all the way to different kinds of fighter airplanes or large transport category airplanes. I can't wait to pilot this vehicle. It is an incredible honor and something that I never in my wildest dreams thought would be a possibility. And so to get a chance to pilot one of the newest vehicles on or off the planet is a true honor. With Chell as our commander and Samantha and Jessica as our mission specialists, it's just going to continue to be an amazing crew and an amazing experience. I am really looking forward to the camaraderie and the time that we'll get to spend together as a crew, the friendships that we'll develop, and so I think continuing that process is one of the things that I'm looking most forward to. On launch day, I am 100% most looking forward to the kick in the pants when those rocket motors light and we are heading off the launch pad. It is going to be the culmination of a lifehood dream, uh, something that just spend your entire life looking for and not ever sure that you're actually going to achieve it. Our newest astronaut, Bob Hines. Being an astronaut is an incredible responsibility as well as an incredible honor. Every astronaut recognizes the honor that comes with that, but also the responsibility that comes with representing not only our respective countries, but also the world. And one of the things that we hope to show is that regardless of our nationalities or our backgrounds, when we put our mind to a single mission and we get along, we can accomplish anything. The turn that you see the convoy making right there is right in front of the historic vehicle assembly building where right now we've got a mega moon rocket inside the SLS and Orion spacecraft and you'll see that there, the cars below and uh, here comes the VAB. They got to be thinking a little bit about that, don't you think, Megan? That uh, you know, they're flying out of 39A, but one day there's going to be a big moon rocket going out of 39B, which is the other way. Absolutely. I know they're thinking about it. Uh, even if it's just something down in the future for them, that uh, could be their, very well be their next ride. Beautiful shot there, the VAB. As the crew goes right by us, in fact, here at the uh, host desk, there's our camera on the ground catching the shot, and you can hear the helicopter overhead. Now the crew convoy is approaching pad 39A, and that's an area known as the Blast Danger Area, or BDA. And before any pad technicians, engineers, or astronauts enter this area around the launch pad, the SpaceX and NASA teams, they conduct an internal go, no-go poll to make sure that that area is safe for them to enter, and there they go. So let's hear now from one of our mission specialists, Jessica Watkins. Exploring is about pushing the bounds of what we are capable of as humans. It gets at who we are intrinsically as people. And so because of that, I think it really is something that unites all of us together here on Earth. My name is Jessica Watkins, and I'm a mission specialist for NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station. At a pretty early age, I got kind of set on the idea of becoming an astronaut. That was when I kind of first voiced the dream and interest in space and in, in being an astronaut in particular. My parents always stressed uh, the importance of getting a good education and finding something that you're passionate about. And so finding geology, finding that love of mine, that passion, was really a turning point for me in my career. My graduate work focused mostly on the geology of Mars. It was part of my interest in wanting to pursue internships at NASA and gave me that exposure to those different possibilities of what careers are possible in this planetary geology field. Deciding to be an astronaut is kind of setting out a dream for yourself and then kind of uh, stowing it in the back of your head, at least in, in my case. 
So the day that I received the phone call to invite me to come down to Johnson Space Center and become an astronaut just really was truly a dream come true. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest astronaut, Jessica Watkins. And I still am waiting for somebody to pinch me and, and wake me up. The opportunity to be the first black woman on an International Space Station long duration crew is exciting. It certainly is important to me and impactful to me to be able to be a part of the legacy that uh, so many before me have paved the way to enable me to be here now. As much as I can be a small part of that legacy, I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity. Being selected to be a part of this Crew 4 mission is truly an honor. I am so excited about the opportunity to fly with Chell, Samantha, and Bob. All three of them are very different. They all bring different skill sets, different experiences. But I think all four of us together really just coalesce well as a crew. I think launch day is going to be the day that all this starts to really finally feel real. And so I just look forward to that moment of exhale and of excitement um, all at the same time. NASA astronaut Jessica Watkins there as we follow the convoy live, making their way out to the pad. And we are expecting a formal announcement that the crew is on pad right around T minus two hours and 55 minutes. That's the schedule. Sometimes we run a little early, a little behind, but um, it looks like we're right on time at the moment. Looking ahead a little bit at about T minus two hours and 35 minutes, the astronauts will ingress or climb into the Dragon with the assistance of the suit techs and, and then they'll get buckled in making the turn there. Direct your attention to some space facts in the lower left-hand corner. We'll be putting those up throughout the broadcast. Some interesting factoids about the crew and the mission. There they are going around uh, SpaceX's uh, horizontal integration facility, Megan. And at this point, when you're pulling up to the rocket, probably hard to see because it's so tall but you know it's there and you're inside the launch pad area you really are and uh, i think actually wadi expressed it really well um in that it's an exhale and it's a, a building of excitement all at the same time because you realized this is the day i've been working for i've reached this point um and in a sense you you relax because you got there you exhale but also wow this uh, next thing that you're about to do is even more amazing and exciting and so the uh, the excitement is building and of course the focus and attention that they're going to bring to all of the tasks ahead of them um, and they they're realizing that that moment is getting closer and closer as they approach the rocket the inside shot driving right by the rocket that you saw there through the front windshield as they make their turn into the pad area and a beautiful view from our helicopter orbiting the launch pad 39A. You saw the, you see the three vehicles down there in the lower left-hand corner. They have arrived. There's been a, a lot of upgrades to this launch pad, Megan. You flew it and flew out of there under both configurations, both as a space shuttle astronaut and as an astronaut on Crew Dragon. That's right, and uh, we get an opportunity to tour the launch pad with a family member in the days leading up to the launch, which is really special. But other than that, we don't spend a whole lot of time on the launch pad. So getting to see it for us is always a very special thing as well. Um, it does look very different now um, under, the, under the new owners, uh, but you can still see the bones of it, of the historical structure that was there supporting the, all those shuttle launches. Speaking of bones, that metal, black metal to the left, we're panning around it, but that is the old rotating service structure that used to have that gigantic structure that would you know, uh, contain the cargo bay of the space shuttle so you could get in and out of it, service right. it. Uh, it would rotate out. Still part of it there on the pad. One, we're at T minus two hours, 59 minutes. The crew have arrived at the pad. We are on schedule. There's the announcement of the arrival and 
Before the crew makes their way to the elevator at the ground level of pad 39A, let's get a look at mission specialist and ESA astronaut Samantha Christopheretti. I got the call to become an astronaut uh, one evening. I had this feeling that the whole universe just stopped, turned around and smiled at me. My name is Samantha Cristoforetti and I'm a mission specialist on the NASA SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Milan in Italy, but I grew up in a tiny little village in the northeastern Alps, uh, still in Italy. So a very rural place, small place. In the mountains, I grew up skiing and enjoying the outdoors. My parents owned a hotel, so that's what they did all their working life. Uh, we actually lived in the hotel, it was our home. I started dreaming about becoming an astronaut pretty early on. I was still in elementary school. I think it was a number of impressions that made me dream about that. The things that I was learning in school, also books that I read. I was an avid reader of adventure books. The fact that I was growing up in a place uh, where I had an opportunity to go out and play and explore with other kids unsupervised and get that passion for adventure. So a number of those things, and I guess they were enough to kindle that spark of passion for space exploration. I completed my high school in Italy and then I enrolled at the Technical University of Munich in their engineering degree and I chose the aerospace track. And then something unexpected happened. The opportunity opened up of actually joining the Italian Air Force as a pilot. That had not been possible for me straight out of high school because back then the Italian military did not admit women. The very broad educational and training background that I had when I became an astronaut really helped me a lot. And the astronaut job is really very much about this broad spectrum of things that you have to master rather than being a specialist that has mastered very, very well for a long time this one thing. And so I was, I was very grateful in hindsight. In 2014, I had the opportunity of flying to space for the first time and I spent 200 days on the International Space Station. Getting to the space station, opening the hatch, hugging our friends who were waiting for us there, getting used to that sensation of floating, the first look out of the cupola, the first, you know, full view of the sunrise. It was almost overwhelming for me. And, you know, of course, as the time goes by, you settle into a routine, you know, you're not overwhelmed by emotion every single day. But it becomes more like a quiet affection for the place, for the work, for, for the people. Getting selected for Crew 4 was amazing because it's an opportunity to go back to the International Space Station and experience a game, that transformation from being an earthbound creature to being this space-living creature and being part of that very, very special life up there in this outpost of humanity up there in space. Samantha Christopheretti, the third consecutive ESA astronaut to ride aboard the Crew Dragon. It all began with Crew 2 and Tomas Pesquet. You remember that well. There's a look at the launch pad, pad 39A. At the very top, Crew Dragon Freedom, a brand new spacecraft from SpaceX, riding on top of the Falcon 9 rocket below. This Falcon 9 rocket made an interesting note. It is the, when it flies today, it'll be the fourth time that this booster has flown. So a reuse for the fourth time. That's the first time for a crewed, uh, for a crewed capsule to go on top of a rocket and get a fourth flight. Um, of course, they have passed four how many times ago. In fact, just last week, they launched uh, a booster for the 12th time. Right. Um, but uh, that's really reuse in action with astronauts on board. Right, it's an amazing capability that actually started uh, with us. We, I think, were the first flight proven booster uh, launched uh, a year ago. And so, you know, true to fashion, they are making leaps and strides in that reusability territory. Of course, very careful to make sure that the all the parts and pieces pass all of the necessary safety checks um, and are rated to refly again. Um, and their fleet leaders, of course, being used on uncrewed vehicles 
so that they can push those boundaries and, and get more and more data, but with, a, with an uncrewed uh, vehicle. Absolutely. And that is exactly what makes this, uh, the, the cycle of reusability uh, work so well as uh, administration at NASA have talked about studying closely, very closely this booster before it flew. Megan, how about we take some more uh, questions from social Sounds media? Sounds great. You've been taking them throughout the night, and we will continue to do so here at T-minus two hours and 53 minutes and counting. And Andrew Pino wants to know, Megan MacArthur, what is your advice to students who are interested in becoming astronauts in the future? And I'm sure you get asked this one a lot. I do get asked this question a lot. I remember asking the question when I was a student, wondering, well, how do I get this job, right? So um, it's an important question. It does change a little bit over the years, but the fundamentals are going to be the same probably for a long time. So when you're looking to work um, as a professional astronaut, work for your government, there's going to be some kind of a selection process involved, and that's going to involve um, looking at at your schooling, what kinds of schooling um, did you did you partake in? And for the most part, it's going to be engineers, um, scientists, people with some kind of operational background. So what I mean by that is you are able to work in a technical field where where you are part of the environment. So that's sometimes pilots. It can be um, uh, folks working on submarines. Oh, this is uh, one of my favorite moments when the crew gets to first look up at their rocket, uh, ready to go. That's Chell Lindgren and Bob Hines giving a look, and That's right. Bob looks a little giddy. Yeah, he's pretty excited. Look at that rocket. <laughs> yep, I like that sort of characteristic, the lean back, the look up together. It's a good, uh, it's a good look. And the wave as they get ready to get into the elevators to ride up to the top where the crew access arm is, which will take them to the spacecraft. It is the original elevators. They've been, of course, renovated, but... Those are the same elevators you got in, Megan, as both a shuttle astronaut and a Dragon uh, yeah. crew member. It's another piece of history. Hopefully at this time of night they won't be taking up too many mosquitoes with them. want to let you finish your thought. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> want to let you finish your thought about the training of uh, getting, getting ready to to try and put yourself in a position to become an astronaut. Absolutely. So, uh, so working in a in a technical field and really working with a team. Astronauts do not work as solo agents for the most part. It's really about your team skills, which can both be leadership skills and followership skills, and the ability to do both things. So, my advice, you know, wherever you're at in school, is seek out those team projects, whether they're part of your formal education or there's something that you want to do on the side that you and your friends develop together. Those team experiences where you're working together to build something and operate something are really valuable. Absolutely. Great advice. As we see the first two astronauts make their way up out of the elevators and towards the crew access arm. Some fist pumps with their crew. And then they'll make their way over to a telephone for a last call. Well, a last call before they leave Earth. That's right. Yeah. To their family members. So this is about the moment when your family members and loved ones realize they really hope they've left their phone on. They haven't put it on mute um, because you, you do hopefully get a phone call from the launch pad. Um, there's, that, there's that bend back look again. There should be a name for that move. There should be. We'll see if we can come up with one. But We uh, should name it. Yeah. Samantha and Jessica there. How about just lean back look? <laughs> it's, you got you to gotta, uh, feather rocket in there somehow. Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah. I'm going to work on that, Megan. I'll, I'll okay. get with you later. Okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so on the right-hand side, we have Samantha and Jessica getting ready to get into the elevator. On the left-hand side, um, Bob and Chell making that phone call. There's a phone there. It has very large buttons for dialing the numbers um, because you've got those big gloves on. Got those big gloves on, that's right. And, of course, you can't put the phone up against your ear. Um, with that helmet on. So you're essentially kind of shouting into the receiver and, and doing your best to hear what is maybe shouted back. But it's just that one last chance to send the I love you's back and forth over uh, over the phone wires before you leave the planet. So do you have to memorize the number since it's uh, Actually, there? typically there's someone there that dials for you. Oh, very good. Yeah. But That's you're helpful. right. Nowadays, people, you often don't memorize phone numbers, yeah. right? We all get them out of our, our mobile phones. That's so. right. They've thought of everything, though. Someone's got it written down. <laughs> you know, and, and we should expect nothing less. <laughs> you can see the, the chevrons on the ground and the direction that they point. Those have a purpose as well. 
That's right. The chevrons are directing in the event of a contingency where there are people on the launch pad. The chevrons are um, one signal, a visual signal that's easy to see if there's you know darkness or smoke to direct you away from the rocket and toward the um, the baskets that you would ride in to get far away from the launch pad. And now our mission specialists have caught up. So it looks like um, Bob Hines is having a nice little conversation there. This is a beautiful, sh beautiful shot from our helicopter. Yes. Uh, looking at the top of the launch tower and the crew access arm to the right goes out to the rocket. You looked at that view. It's nighttime, and we are in a national wildlife refuge, so I imagine there's not a whole lot to see, but still. It, it is pretty special, and you're sort of realizing this is as close as I'm going to get to nature for a while. Yeah. And so it's a special um, feeling. You get a little bit of breeze on your face, um, and that's a special feeling as well, things that you're going to miss when you're closed up inside the International Space Station. Samantha and Jessica taking advantage of exactly what you just said, the chance to look out at planet Earth one last time before getting inside Crew Dragon. And I heard the astronauts from Crew 3 talking the other day about what they missed, and they were such earthly things, you know. Um, Thomas Marshburn talked about wanting to, to just have the wind blow in his face. Yes. They talked about a hot bath. <laughs> <laughs> I went running in the rain and it felt wonderful. It, uh, I just had a smile on my face the whole time with, you know, rain running down my face and down my neck and into my clothes, but it just was, it felt like, yep, I am, I'm here on Earth. This is good. Space is awesome to visit, but it's nice to come back home. Isn't it, it is, yeah. If you're just joining us, you are watching live coverage of NASA's SpaceX mission known as Crew 4. Good evening and welcome to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Daryl Nail, along with a recent pilot aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon, the voice of NASA astronaut Megan MacArthur. She is here and giving us great insight into the mission today. Thanks, Daryl. It's really, I just really enjoy watching them go through this and remembering what it was like for us um, but as well, knowing that they're going to have their own individual take on it, their individual experience, and just seeing already the camaraderie, the relationships between the crew members, and knowing that they're going to have such a fun and successful time up there. Walking down the crew access scarm comes Bob Hines and Chell Lindgren. We see them inside, and the shot to the left from the outside. Love that shot. The closeout team not far behind. They have some work to do to get them inside. And now our mission specialists have the opportunity to make that phone call. We are T minus two hours and 45 minutes and counting until the liftoff of Crew 4 from the Kennedy Space Center. This is now a look inside the White Room. Shell has arrived. Score on countdown one. We are at T minus two hours, 45 minutes. The crew have arrived at the white room and are preparing for ingress. We are on schedule. Right on schedule. You see, he's got the Sharpie in his hand he and Megan, he's signing that white wall inside the white room. He is. He's signing his name there in preparation for launch. All of the crews uh, that have launched from there previously will have already signed their name and so each one of the crew members uh, will get to do that and as you know the the white room is not really a room it's just kind of the end of that walkway so it is a relatively small space that's being used to do final suit preparations um, it does have some a small amount of emergency equipment in there so it is a tight little space um, but it's important to take that time and acknowledge those traditions that are being built and renewed here your name is on that wall on that wall hopefully they didn't write over it Ooh, yeah. I might have to go back and check. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a look after the launch and just make sure everything's... That's right. Make sure it's all good. <laughs> In fact, that Sharpie is, uh, is an item on a checklist. Of course SpaceX it is, SpaceX makes yes. sure that, uh, that it's there. And here come our next two astronauts. We're finishing up one last phone call, it looks like. 
and then they'll probably walk together. Were you able to hear the call that you made? Were you able to hear? It's it's difficult because, again, you can't get the receiver up inside your helmet against mm -hmm. your ear. And so once your family realizes that, then they're, you know, essentially shouting. It's not time for a nuanced conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like Jessica and Samantha are wrapped up. Getting some hugs or there. Or no, we have, we might... kind of getting juked out here. No, there they go. And here come Jessica and Samantha. They'll Big walk smiles. down the crew access arm with broad smiles. <laughs> well, Samantha is saying something, not sure what she's saying, but uh, she is smiling. I think they could about smile their way into space just on the energy alone. That's right. The white room also allows for uh, completion of cargo load at T minus 24 hours. So it has use to both get the astronauts inside the crew capsule and uh, to get that late stowage. This is part of the countdown that we call ingress, a milestone that we have reached at uh, inside the two hour and 42 minute mark. Simply means that the astronauts are getting inside Crew Dragon. The closeout team surrounds them and is preparing them to go inside. They have covers on their boots that make sure Everything is kept clean upon entering the capsule. Uh, Samantha flashing us the crew four. That's a great shot looking back towards the crew access arm as the closeout team does their work right there between Jessica and Samantha and the signatures with some there fresh ink. That's right. Those helmets are 3D printed and customized. All right, let's check back in with our team at uh, SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. I'll send it over to Jesse and Dan. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, it's really exciting to see the crew starting to ingress the Dragon vehicle and get ready for their journey to the International Space Station. Just a quick clarification, their journey will be about 16 hours long uh, once they lift off this morning. Yeah, that's, that's right about in the middle of what we've seen for most of these missions. They can be as short as eight if we end up getting a basically a phasing angle that works really, really well. They can be as long as two days, so about 16 hours will be nice. But right now, they, they're they ingressing the capsule, as Daryl said. We've got Jessica Watkins uh, still out here in the White Room. White Room is kind of their last stop on planet Earth. It's As we said, it's the end of the, the access arm. There's a seal that extends from the White Room around the capsule just to help keep uh, the Dragon interior as clean of an environment as possible, keep out all the, the moisture, the humidity from that Florida weather. And so each of the crew members, they're doing the signing. They're also getting what's known as a FOD check, a foreign object debris check, just making sure that they're not bringing any dust, debris, particles, things like that in that could interfere uh, with the umbilicals or any of the different systems, because anything that goes in that capsule is going to space for the next six months. I'm really exciting to see Jessica Watkins and Samantha Cristoforetti signing their names. Uh, and they do have this in the procedure uh, to have the Sharpie ready for them uh, so that they can 
do this signing before they ingress the Dragon vehicle. Looks like now they both have signed their signatures and next steps is to start ingressing the Dragon capsule. Yep, we've got Chell and Bob in already. And when we get a look in through the hatch, the seats are numbered one through four. So when you're looking in from the hatch, it goes from right to left. Uh, so that seat all the way on the right will be seat one. And that's where Samantha Chris Ferretti is bound. Uh, just to the left of that is seat number two. That's the commander seat and Chell Lindgren already seated there. Next to that, the pilot seat, seat number three, where Bob Hines is going to be riding uphill. And then Jessica Watkins will be in seat four all the way on the left. Uh, and these seats have a connection point to the suits. They've got an umbilical, basically a, a hose almost, that uh, plugs into the leg of the suits. And that provides a couple of really critical functions for the suit. It uh, gives them a hardline connection to communications uh, through the Dragon spacecraft. It also provides uh, the capability to flow just conditioned cabin air to help them stay cool. Um, so uh, performing a similar function to that blue box we saw them carrying earlier. Uh, but then one of the really critical ones uh, that all of the different umbilical points can provide is pressurized nitrox. And that's to uh, if these suits need to be pressurized for any reason, we can flow that in. If they're in a depressurized cabin, if there's an issue with the atmosphere or anything like that, that suit can provide a pressurized, safe environment for the crew members. And you can see on your right-hand screen that all four of the crew members are now sitting in their seats. Uh, you can see the suit techs there helping them get strapped in or harnessed into each of their seats and their umbilicals uh, attached to their suits. Um, and every part of this process uh, is very precise. Uh, you did see uh, as the crew uh, ingressed through the hatchway, the suit techs even put their their hand over their helmet. Um, that's a part of the procedure, again, to make sure that they're, you know, they don't damage anything as they enter the vehicle. Same with as they're uh, putting together their um, harnessing. Um, again, every step of this process is very precise, and uh, we might be able to see it in a minute here, but they do have uh, some tablets and some pads with them where the, the crew can follow along with every procedure, every step of the way. And we were just looking at Chell Lindgren. He's seen this entire process from up close before. Uh, we saw Zena Cardman. She's the ASP, the astronaut support personnel for this one. Uh, Chell did it back on Crew 1 and got some Internet notoriety as he was the SpaceX ninja that had two umbrellas as it was a rainy day. Um, so... <laughs> getting a little fame from that one but so he, he did that for the crew ones this is not his first trip down this walkway and but this time he's going to be strapping in and, and heading uphill so they're they're getting strapped in uh, they've got a five point harness that's going to be uh, secured throughout the entire ascent portion they're going to be in their suits until they're on orbit they're going to wear these suits for all of the different what we call dynamic phases of flight so that's where the vehicle's actively making maneuvers and so that's obviously going to be launch and ascent uh, they'll put their suits back on when we get into the docking with this uh, with the international space station uh, same in reverse they'll wear them for undocking uh, and then they'll wear them at the very end of the mission when we get to the deorbit re-entry and splashdown Once the suit techs uh, finish getting the crew all settled in, uh, they will do some comm checks, then rotate to their seats into launch position. Uh, right now the seats are rotated down so that they are much more accessible, but once they rotate upwards, they'll be able to access those display panels that you can kind of see right above uh, the pilot and commander seat there. And these, uh, these Dragon seats are actually custom made for each crew member. Uh, they kind of go hand in hand with their custom suits, um, and the suits are basically an extension of the Dragon vehicle. Um, so pretty cool. They get their own custom-made seats, uh, custom-made suit, which is almost like their own personal AC system. <laughs> yeah, we'll see them get strapped in, and then there's, as Jesse said, there's a couple of events that we're gonna we're gonna listen to and we're gonna see take place. Uh, those communication checks will come up. We'll hear 
uh, the core. That's the essentially the voice of Mission Control Hawthorne. Uh, which for today is Arthur Barrio. So we'll hear his voice when we get ready for the communications checks. They'll call up to the crew. They'll get a, a quick comm check from each of the crew members. So they'll call down. You'll hear them call down as commander, pilot, or PLT, MS-1, MS-2 for the two mission specialists. And they're going to be talking to the core throughout the entire mission. And they're also going to do a communication check with a couple of other of the key team members. Um, one, the SpaceX mission director, who here in Hawthorne has uh, the overall authority for the mission. Uh, and also the SpaceX launch director, or LD, who's overseeing all of the pre-launch and launch preparations down there at Kennedy. And then we'll do those communications checks over a couple of different paths, uh, both through ground sites and also through what's known as TDRS, the tracking and data relay satellites. That's what uh, same satellites we use for command telemetry data with the space station and same satellites that are used to get all of that to and from Dragon. Um, so they'll do all of those checks. They're also going to do another round of suit leak checks. Uh, so we saw them do that in the suit up room a little while ago. Um, now that they're actually on board Dragon, able to integrate into the systems, use the umbilicals, they'll do another leak check, uh, and then the crew will be one step closer to launch. And really exciting to see, if you're just now joining us, the Crew 4 astronauts are now in their seats. They have ingressed Dragon, and we do still have the suit techs there still assisting with getting them settled in and, and prepared for their mission today. Uh, the suit techs help with getting their harnessing strapped uh, for each of the crew members, getting their umbilicals attached, um, and again, as Dan mentioned, they will be doing some comm checks uh, here shortly once they are all settled in um, into their seats. And once we get to those checks, you'll see them using their armrests. That's where they have a, a couple of different buttons. Uh, one is to actually enable uh, that communication. They can change their, their Vox settings, their, their audio communication settings, um, just for volume levels, things like that, inside the helmet. Uh, they're, they're in a rotated position right now just for ingress, but after we get through a couple of more steps, we'll get to seat rotation. So we'll see their feet swing up a little bit. They uh, rotate the seats by a little less than 30 degrees to put them in the launch position. And this is to orient them just for the best position for managing the G loads on the way uphill. Uh, it also gives them direct access to those displays. Yeah, Dan, and there's some pretty cool features about the, these suits as well. Uh, the helmets, uh, you mentioned uh, the audio uh, attachment on their uh, armrest. Uh, the helmets themselves have the audio basically designed into them. Um, and the helmets are 3D printed, which is pretty cool. Uh, the suits are flame resistant. And the gloves, um, as Dan mentioned, they will be using that display, uh, those display screens above the pilot and commander seat. Those gloves are actually uh, designed to be able to use on that touchscreen. And that touchscreen is where Shell Linger and Bob Hines have basically all of their direct insight into Dragon systems. They can dig down into all of the different subsystems, and the alerts or alarms will show up there. And that's also the means of manual piloting for Dragon. There's no control sticks, there's no flight sticks, anything like that. Uh, it's all done via touchscreen. In fact, SpaceX had a really cool uh, interactive where you could do it on the web um, when we did Demo 2 about two years ago. And it's, it's very similar. They use that touchscreen to take control and command Dragon uh, if required. Again, the flight designed to be autonomous the whole way, uh, but those touchscreens can be used should the crew need to step in. Uh, both Chell Lindgren and Bob Hines, both trained, both capable, uh, to jump in and pilot Dragon. And there's also a row of buttons. You can just see them at the top of your screen uh, that sit below those touch screens. Those are uh, hard line buttons to a couple of just really critical items. Um, if you need to basically hit them immediately, uh, things like 
initiating a deorbit, suppressing fire. There's uh, uh, several buttons for some of the different pyrotechnics on the vehicle, deploying parachutes, um, and that display. That's just a cluster that's just beneath uh, those touchscreens. Looking like we're getting close to getting the suit techs out of there. Yeah, it looks like we had some fist bumps, and these suit techs are now egressing or exiting the Dragon capsule. All right, well, with the suit tech starting to get out of there, we should be coming up now on those communications checks and suit leak checks. So we should be getting some call outs from the core, the crew operations and resource engineer uh, coming up in just a couple of minutes. So again, we've got a couple of those milestones coming up. We're gonna do those communications checks. They're gonna do leak checks. Uh, and then after we get through all of those, we'll be a little bit closer uh, to closing out some of the final pad ops that that closeout team will be responsible for closing that side hatch on the Dragon spacecraft, which will get its own leak check. Uh, and once that side hatch is closed, it, and once we pass the leak check, uh, it doesn't open again until Dragon is splashed down at the very end of the mission. Yeah, we've got some really cool views of the pad on your left-hand screen with the crew, crew four crew inside of the Dragon capsule there. Uh, so far, we've had a pretty on-time uh, schedule today. Uh, the crew, we did watch live as the crew, were, they were all in the suit-up room uh, doing their suit leak checks. Uh, we followed them as they got into their Teslas and, and rode to the launch pad as they uh, climbed the fixed service structure. Um, and now the crew is all settled into their seats. The suit techs are out of the Dragon vehicle. Um, and now are prepping for the next steps, as Dan mentioned, uh, getting ready for the hatch closure, um, as well as the, the comms, uh, comms checks that we should hear coming up. Great checks. We are ready for comms checks. SpaceX copies Freedom. Stand by for umbilical comms checks. Standing by. Great timing. Sounds like comp checks are starting now. We're just standing by for those communications checks to, to pick up. That's the core, the crew operations and resource engineer, Arthur Barrio. On the left side of your screen, he's sitting just behind us in MCCX here on Hawthorne. Again, we're going to hear uh, him give a call up to the crew. He'll get comm checks from the commander and the pilot first. CDR, PLT, MS-1, MS-2, comm check. Freedom CDR, loud and clear. Freedom, PLT, loud and clear. Freedom, MS-1, loud and clear. Freedom, MS-2, loud and clear. Core copy is loud and clear. Umbilical comm check is complete. Stand by for ground station comm check. Freedom, standing by. So we're, we're through the first, the umbilical check. Now they're going to check through ground stations. SpaceX operates uh, a suite of ground stations across the planet uh, to get uh, data telemetry and voice to and from Dragon is an additional path in a, along with the, the primary one, those TDRS tracking and data relay satellites. Freedom, SpaceX, come check. SpaceX, Freedom has you on foot. Core, loud and clear. Ground station comm check is complete. Stand by for TDRS comm check. Freedom, stand by.
Freedom, SpaceX ComCheck. SpaceX, Freedom, thank you, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Teacher's ComCheck is complete. Stand by for ComChecks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon MD on countdown one, calm check. MD, Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. MD, loud and clear, stand by for calm check over Dragon to ground. Freedom MD on Dragon to ground, calm check. MD, Freedom has you loud and clear over Dragon to ground. Good to hear your voice this morning, Anna. Good to hear yours as well. MD loud and clear. Stand by for comp checks with LD. Freedom, LD on countdown one, comp check. LD, Freedom has you loud and clear on countdown one. Good morning, sir. Orange shell, LD loud and clear. Stand by for comp check over dragon to ground. Freedom, LD on dragon to ground, comp check. LD, Freedom has you loud and clear of the dragon to ground. LD, loud and clear. Freedom SpaceX, with that shell, launch configuration comp checks are now complete. Please report when ready for seat rotation per section two of four decimal one zero zero. Freedom copies, we'll come. SpaceX, Freedom, we are ready for seat rotation for 2 decimal 2. Copy that, Chell. We'll report when initiating. So we're just hearing that the comms checks have been completed successfully, and we're about to get into seat rotation here in a couple of minutes. Uh, really, no issues in work as the countdown continues smoothly. Uh, we heard updates from the team that things are uh, on schedule several times, which is always a good thing uh, for liftoff. Uh, the Dragon Launch Ops team has completed their major activities to prepare the spacecraft for the astronauts. Um, the Falcon 9 team uh, is also located Dragon in the firing room initiating seat rotation. 4 in the Launch Control Center at Freedom Kennedy Conference. Space Center. And you just heard the call out that we are beginning seat rotation. And if we get this, uh, if we keep this camera view, you should see the astronauts start to tilt back uh, and uh, be in their launch configuration. And there it goes. Some waves to the suit technicians as they continue to rotate up. Now this does a couple of things. This gets them uh, first and foremost uh, ready uh, for when we do ignite the Merlin engines on the first stage for ascent, but it also gives the pilot and the commander uh, access and better visibility to the, uh, the LCD screens that you see in front of them. After, this, after the seat rotations, we should be going into another round of suit leak checks. And really that is uh, one of the last operations before we close the side hatch. Freedom, SpaceX, seats are in the launch position. Freedom copies, concurs. There was a confirmation that we did uh, successfully rotate the seats. Um, just a quick update on range and weather. Both are really looking good. Uh, we look at weather not only at the launch site but around the world. We need to make sure conditions are acceptable if Dragon has to splash down in the Atlantic in case of an escape. We're also monitoring contingency splashdown locations if the crew had to come back to Earth before and docking at this time with I the give space you a station. Go for section three suit leak check preparation. Okay, we copy. We are go and four decimal one hundred uh, three decimal one for suit leak preparation.
of the teams are getting ready to start those sleep checks on the spacesuits. So the clock continues to count down. We are at T minus two hours and 18 minutes until liftoff. Uh, but as this continues to count down, we're going to check in with Chelsea at um, Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Hey, thanks and welcome to the International Space Station's Flight Control Room here in Mission Control, Houston. A team of flight controllers behind me is actively monitoring the space station as we speak. The crew in orbit has completed a number of tasks to prepare the station for Crew 4, like setting up tools to monitor Dragon's arrival and prepping the sleep stations for Crew 4. Many of their clothes and other belongings launched on previous cargo resupply launches and are at the station now. But back here in Houston, Flight Director Anthony Baria and his team are in constant communication with the SpaceX Mission Director for Crew 4's launch to the International Space Station. Once we get to integrated operations, the NASA flight director will be conducting a series of go, no go polls at the predetermined checkpoints for Dragon's approach. But for now, we'll continue following along from right here in Mission Control Houston. So I'll send it back down to the team in Kennedy. Over to you, Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Chelsea. And if you're just joining us, it is T minus two hours and 17 minutes and counting until SpaceX's Archel, fourth I operation. I can now give you a go for section four suit leak check. Suit leak check beginning as we get the call out audio Happy from. Go for section four. And those are the astronauts, the crew four astronauts communicating with the core there. Um, we are ready for another beautiful crew launch. Got Megan MacArthur here, the pilot from Crew Two and a space shuttle astronaut. We're so grateful that you're here sharing your insight and your stories. Thanks. It's really fun to be here and watch them go through all of these activities step by step and uh, excited to see uh, everything that comes up. Brings back memories, doesn't it? It sure when you does. Were sitting yeah. In that seat. Yeah. Remember, you were playing a game. We were playing a game. Yes. There is a fair amount of time where nothing specific is happening, and so of course um, you want to. You're taking your job seriously. You you do review some things uh, that might happen and how you would respond, but you also just have some time to kill. So we did have some uh, games that Thomas Pesquet was in charge of keeping us entertained during that downtime. Thomas was great for that. <laughs> he was. He was like our cruise director. <laughs> right. Brought a lot of levity. And as you look live inside uh, the Freedom capsule there, uh, closest to us is Chell Lindgren. And right next to his right is Bob Hines, has his arms up on the display screen. The seats have been articulated up into launch position, and it looks like they're on their back from the orientation of the shot there. And is it that is that pretty accurate? That is accurate. So when they first climb in, the seats are um, in a lowered position that just it's a little bit easier to ingress. But it is difficult from that other position to see and interact with the screens. And so with the seats raised like that, they are tilted a little bit more onto their backs and they're raised so that they're just able to look directly across at those touch screens to monitor their position and their data. Right, as we watch the astronauts uh, go through their final checks and look at the display screens. Let's take a minute to learn more about what Crew 4 astronauts will be doing after they arrive on station. is the fourth crew rotation flight for the SpaceX Dragon vehicle. Crew 4's goals are to safely and successfully get to the International Space Station and then to spend the allotted time living and working in space, meeting all of the planned research and science and maintenance goals of the space station program. We are all like, super excited about the opportunity to fly on a Crew Dragon spacecraft. That vehicle is a, a super complex, modern vehicle that enables us to get to space efficiently and safely. Uh, my role as pilot on the uh, Dragon vehicle is primarily to uh, monitor and maintain the systems of the vehicle itself. To get a chance to pilot one of the newest vehicles on or off the planet uh, is a true honor. Getting selected for Crew 4 was, uh, was amazing because it, it, it's, it's an opportunity to go back to the International Space Station and experience again that transformation from 
being an earthbound creature to being this space living creature. When you get to space station, the, yeah, the first thing that really strikes is this feeling of weightlessness. I'm so excited to revisit the space station. It was home for five months back in 2015. You know, we arrived on orbit and really within a couple of days, my brain adjusted to the idea of floating. Not that I was good at it, but the novelty of it. I think that the fact that our brains can adapt to something that is so novel, so different, something that we're completely unaccustomed to for all of our lives, and that it can just, just adapt like that is absolutely amazing. The International Space Station is a national laboratory built to do science. The connecting element between all the experiments that we do up there is the space environment and specifically weightlessness, microgravity, as the scientists like to say. When you're dealing with complex systems, uh, one way to learn how they work is to start removing variables. Uh, we're able to do a lot of that down here on Earth, uh, but one of the things that we have a challenge doing and we can't do is remove the effects of gravity. And so by taking things to the International Space Station, we can remove that and we can see how these complex systems work, how things grow, how they develop. We do so much research up there that not only helps technologies and development uh, down here on Earth, but it is also aiding NASA's pivot back into deep space exploration. The work that we do every day helps us to better understand how the human body changes in weightlessness and to understand how to do the operations like spacewalks and robotic arm activities that are necessary uh, for us to be successful in lunar orbit, on the lunar surface, and on our way to Mars. We get this awesome opportunity to be representatives of, of humanity, of all of you, and we don't take that lightly. We're super honored to have that responsibility and are excited about sharing the journey with, with all of you. There's so much work that the crew does once they get up to the International Space Station, but at the moment as you're looking live, outside the Dragon capsule, they're on the ground. How long, Megan, does it take for the astronauts once you get there? They gotta, they gotta launch, they gotta fly, they gotta rendezvous and get into the space station. Are you ready to go or does it take some time before you can start doing all that important research? It, it takes some time for your body to adjust, but I think it helps that you're working during that time while your body is adjusting. The space station is a super unique environment um, with the micro G conditions that we can't duplicate here on Earth for any long duration of time. And so not only are you excited to get to work and start doing these science projects, but it really, I think, helps you adapt to the environment the sooner you start learning to work in it. Mm -hmm. And then once you get rolling, there is a lot of exci exciting science that is happening for this mission. We're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk more in depth with Megan about some of the experiments that she worked on, as well as some that are in the future. And that's coming up a little bit later in the show. But we are currently T minus two hours, 10 minutes and counting. So let's head back out to SpaceX headquarters in California, where Dan and Jesse will be picking up our commentary. Great, thanks, Daryl. Now it took years of hard work to get to where we are with Flying Crew. The development of Crew Dragon really started with Cargo Dragon, and Dragon was designed from the beginning for flying humans to space. Even the first Cargo Dragon had a window despite not having humans on board. Before we could fly humans, our teams implemented a number of design upgrades to make sure that both Dragon and Falcon 9 were suitable for flying people. We then put both vehicles through thousands of tests to prove their safety. Now, since Demo 2 in May of 2020, SpaceX has been regularly flying crewed missions for NASA at the cadence of about one flight every six months. Crew 4 will be SpaceX's fifth crewed space flight for NASA, following the crewed test flight Demo 2 and three previous operational crewed missions to the space station. Now, it will also be SpaceX's seventh crewed space flight overall, including Inspiration 4, the first all-civilian mission to space. Now, Inspiration 4 was really a historic first, and what's really exciting is it certainly will not be the last of its kind. Now, in fact, Jared Isaacman, commander of the Inspiration 4 mission, will return to orbit with SpaceX under the Polaris program which is a series of missions to advance deep space exploration while raising global awareness for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Polaris will consist of up to three human space flight missions that will culminate in the first flight of SpaceX's Starship with humans on board. 
Now, the first mission, Polaris Dawn, is targeted for no earlier than the fourth quarter of this year, and in addition to Mission Commander Jared Isaacman, will include Pilot Scott Kid Poteet, who served as the Mission Director of Inspiration 4, Mission Specialist Sarah Gillis, and Mission Specialist Medic and Medical Officer Anna Menon. During the Polaris Dawn mission, Jared will perform the first ever commercial spacewalk. The mission is also flying higher than any Dragon mission to date and, the, and endeavoring to reach the highest Earth orbit ever flown. And NASA's efforts, particularly with the commercial crew program and the certification of SpaceX's Dragon, are building a foundation for a robust U.S.-led commercial economy in low Earth orbit. Commercial transportation, it's a big one that transportation to space, but that's just one element of our larger plan for commercialization. We're enabling the development of commercial space stations, private astronaut missions, and then demand for in-space manufacturing and more. We just wrapped up the mission with Axiom Space. That was a big part of this effort, and that was the first all-private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. They lifted off back on April 9th on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and spent uh, almost two weeks ended up just some bad weather prevented them from coming home. Uh, but in that Dragon Endeavor for the AX-1 mission, there was the commander and the former NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria, pilot Larry Connor, and then mission specialists uh, Etan Stibbe and Mark Pathy. Uh, and again, they spent a little. They spent more than 10 days uh, in orbit, uh, including an extended stay on board the International Space Station. They just returned. Uh, just this week. Uh, but during that mission, they performed hundreds of hours of research, uh, more than 25 different experiments, and this is just helping to lay the groundwork for a lot of the really exciting stuff coming up, uh, including the Axiom Station, which is going to be a commercial space station attached to the International Space Station and is currently under construction. I mean, low Earth orbit, we know it's an incredible space for scientific research, technology development, Astronaut training, as we go to the moon, we're gonna still need a place to train our astronauts. Low Earth orbit's the place to do it. And its value's been proven through thousands of experiments, decades of international and commercial cooperation on board the station. So just a lot more to come. We're just at the dawn of this commercialization of low Earth orbit. Um, so just can't wait to see even more. But let's get back into the ops. We saw a good suit leak checks. We're getting ready for the hatch close. So let's send it back over to Daryl at KSC uh, along with Megan. Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Dan. As we uh, await side hatch closure, you can see the teams working there. Hatch still open, but they will be inspecting it very closely. You see the light in the hand of one of the closeout team members. They'll be closely examining that seal around the hatch, which is important. This is going to be protecting them from the dangerous environment of space. So you want a good seal. And as we uh, await for them to continue their work, Let's reintroduce you now to the Crew Dragon commander. His name is Jell Lindgren. Here he is. My name is Jell Lindgren, and I'm the commander for NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station. I've wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember. I think I was inspired by the very first space shuttle launch in April of 1981. And that, I think, is really when this dream was just burned into my consciousness. It was an absolute honor to get selected for the Crew-4 mission. And on top of that, to have the opportunity to command. Getting to fly with this amazing crew, with Farmer and Samantha and Wadi, they are incredible astronauts. And I feel very grateful to be on a team with them. But we're one small part of a larger team that spans the nation and the world. We truly get to leverage the best and brightest as we chase somewhat impossible goals. There you see the closeout team going through their last procedures there to shut the side hatch. Seated next to Chell Lindgren is Crew Dragon pilot and NASA astronaut Bob Hines. 
I truly believe that we all have in us an innate desire to go explore and see new things. We have a very unique position in our solar system and our galaxy to be able to look out there and to step out and continue to explore. My name is Bob Hines. I'm the pilot for NASA's SpaceX Crew 4 mission to the International Space Station. When I was a kid, I 100% wanted to be a pilot. Being able to fly and see the Earth from a new perspective has really been just a real driver for me. And getting hired as an astronaut has been the ultimate call. When I got the phone call offering me the position of the pilot on the Crew 4 mission, I just couldn't believe it. I can't wait to pilot this vehicle. It is an incredible honor. It's something that I never in my wildest dreams thought would be a possibility. On launch day, I am 100% most looking forward to the kick in the pants when those rocket motors light and we are heading off the launch pad. And he's going to get that kick in the pants, right, Megan? That's right. <laughs> in seat number one today is mission specialist and NASA astronaut Jessica Watkins, who will be making her first trip to space today. My name is Jessica Watkins, and I'm a mission specialist for NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station. The opportunity to be the first black woman on an International Space Station long-duration crew is exciting. It certainly is important to me and impactful to me to be able to be a part of the legacy that uh, so many before me have paved the way to enable me to be here now. As much as I can be a small part of that legacy, I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity. Being selected to be a part of this Crew 4 mission is truly an honor. We get this awesome opportunity to be representatives of, of humanity, and we don't take that lightly. We're super honored to have that responsibility and are excited about sharing the journey with all of you. And last but not least, in seat number four is Kruth. Uh, for Mission Specialist and European Space Agency astronaut, Samantha Cristoforetti. I got the call to become an astronaut uh, one evening. I had this feeling that the whole universe just stopped, turned around and smiled at me. My name is Samantha Cristoforetti and I'm a Mission Specialist on the NASA SpaceX Crew-4 mission to the International Space Station. I started dreaming about becoming an astronaut pretty early on. I was still in elementary school. And the astronaut job is really very much about this broad spectrum of things that you have to master rather than being a specialist that has mastered one thing. In 2014, I had the opportunity of flying to space for the first time, and I spent 200 days on the International Space Station. Getting selected for Crew 4 was amazing because it's an opportunity to experience again being part of that very, very special life up there in this outpost of humanity and space. And those are your astronauts from Crew 4. A lot of fours in this mission, Megan. It is, of course, Crew 4, the fourth operational flight. It's the fourth flight of a reflown booster. Okay. We're taking off in the fourth month of 2022. <laughs> Lots of fours. Lots of fours. Four very special people getting ready to launch tonight. Indeed. And this is a great crew. They, you can tell that they've bonded over the time that they've been together. Absolutely. The time that you spend in training. Um, even though it's shortened in some cases, is really special. Um, you know that you're doing something unique um, and difficult, and you know you're going to really be in a lot of situations where you rely on one another. And so forming those friendships and those bonds are really going to serve them well over the next six months. Providing us uh, the insight and uh, the explanations throughout this launch broadcast, Megan MacArthur on hand here, shuttle astronaut, crew two pilot on the Dragon. We want to remind you, you can ask her a question right there at the bottom of your screen. You can see how. Just put the hashtag AskNASA into Twitter and send us a tweet. And once we uh, see it, we'll uh, go through them and pass them along to her. She's been answering them all evening and keep those questions coming. In the meantime, let's get over to Andy at SpaceX headquarters for a launch operations update. Andy. 
Thanks, Daryl. We are just under T minus two hours until liftoff, and the countdown is proceeding nominally at this point. On board the brand new Dragon spacecraft Freedom, we heard the communication checks between the Dragon team and the crew, and those went well. The astronaut seats were also rotated in flight position, and right now the closeout leads will verify the cabin environments and then begin procedures to close the side hatch of the Dragon spacecraft. Afterwards, the SpaceX support team will perform the final leak check on the hatch, and once that is finished, the team will begin steps to ready the access arm to retract. Then the closeout team will leave the pad at T minus one hour, leaving just the astronauts on the pad. As for the Falcon 9 team, uh, they are on console in firing room four. Uh, they are preparing the communication checks with the astronauts uh, that is due in just a few minutes here. SpaceX engineers have pressurized the launch vehicle gas storage bottles. These are composite overwrap pressure vessels. They contain gases used to fill the tanks with hot helium as propellant is drained out of the first and second stages during ascent. Once we top them off, uh, we'll top them off in the last half hour or so before liftoff. We also use pressurized gases to spin the Merlin engine turbo pumps when we start an engine in space. The second stage MVAC engine starts up after the first stage separates, and the first stage engines need to be restarted for its landing sequences. The gases are also used for attitude control systems, which helps with vehicle orientation, and for deploying the grid fins, grid fins and landing lights. We continue to monitor weather at launch sites and around the world um, at contingency abort and landing zones, um, but right now everything is green. Uh, so with that, uh, we are at T minus one hour, 57 minutes and counting. Uh, everything's looking good here, so I'll send it back to you, uh, Daryl and Megan. All right, Andy, and thank you. Back here at the Kennedy Space Center, the weather is fantastic. We've got a, a cool evening and calm conditions, which is perfect for launch. As we look at the closeout team finishing their job Ready on their pads, They've got uh, a list of milestones and checks to complete. And as we wait for them to close that side hatch with the four crew astronauts inside, let's take a little moment to take some more questions from social media. And there you see a question up on your screen. The question is, Megan, how would you describe the first moments after arriving to the space station? Well, it's such a magical moment, in fact, once the hatches are opened and you finally get to come through. For me, having um, worked you know, around the space station program for so many years but never actually seen it, it was really, really special to come through and finally see the environment. Plus, you have all of these smiling faces, people that are excited to see you, the folks that are going to be coming home. Um, it's really pretty overwhelming. Lots of hugs, uh, lots of smiles. Um, and it just, uh, you know that you're, you finally reached this goal that you've worked so hard to attain. And you're seeing astronauts that you used to train with, that you know well. It's like coming over to their house. Absolutely. Only yeah, it's space. kind of like your long lost friends. You know, I, yeah. I think I teared up a little bit when I saw my friend Shannon, yeah. you know, big hug. And, mm -hmm. and you kind of get, you know, you pass around, everybody hugs everybody. And you're still learning to move in that environment, too. So you notice the people who have just arrived because they go to hug and then their whole body, you know, sort of swings by <laughs> <laughs> the person that's more stable and stationary. So right. it's, it's a pretty fun rodeo to, uh, to watch those first few moments. Slinging people around that's on right. the uh, International Space that's Station. That's right. There's a lot of joy. <laughs> That's great. Great question. Thank you very much for that one. And Go for Space Launch asks, how long will the Crew 4 and Crew 3 astronauts be on the space station together? Well, that's a great question. So this is what we call a direct handover, meaning that the Crew 4 astronauts will arrive um, and spend several days with the Crew 3 astronauts before uh, we check the weather and make sure it's okay for the Crew 3 astronauts to come home. So typically that's designed to be about four or five days, but it will, of course, depend on the weather conditions. They're going to be looking for good weather to bring home the Crew 3 astronauts safely. Now, you didn't get to hand over with Crew the crew that with followed crew you. three no yeah. we did not but there's a reason you, you pass along a lot of knowledge and experience uh, yes you know on to them handover is really really important between crews you know it's there's so much that you can learn you know from the books if you will or from the simulation but there's so much more that you're going to learn in the real environment and we have the luxury of um, Mark Vandehei of course was up there he mm -hmm. did an entire year in space he's a superhero um, and so we were able to leave to take advantage of the good landing weather knowing that he was going to 
to be there to show everybody the ropes that was arriving on uh, Crew 3. Of course, we would have loved to be there to uh, enjoy their company for a few days, but it does get pretty crowded. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at the line to the bathroom. Yes, it, uh, that's a long line. <laughs> <laughs> Even in space. How about we take another question? That was a great one. Florida Hurricane asks, does the crew participate in any pre-launch traditions? That's a great question. So individual crews might have their own specific pre-launch traditions. Um, and so spending time at the beach house here at Kennedy Space Center with your loved ones is a big part of that tradition. For my family, we were able to go boogie boarding. We had some nice weather, spend some time at the beach. That was a really great tradition. Other traditions that are more common have to do with things we touched on earlier, putting, putting your zap or putting your crew sticker in certain places, signing those things. And they'll do that on board the International Space Station as well. Whenever there's a new vehicle coming or going, we like to put our stickers on everything. And so those are some other traditions that are ongoing and special for this crew they actually got to go out and see the SLS rocket which was on the pad it just recently went back into the VAB so we haven't seen it tonight but that was a special opportunity yes. uh, for them uh, which you know not a lot of crews yes get to not see. many crews will get to see well eventually we'll get we'll get to see more of That's that right. but that must have been a special moment going to visit the mega moon together and thinking hey this could be a next ride for some of us so that had to be pretty special absolutely and they got inside the gate as well so uh, a great opportunity for them well thank you for those social media questions keep them coming shuttle gravity asks why have many of the SpaceX crewed missions launched at night? That's funny. You and I were just talking <laughs> about We were talking just about talking this. about that. Um, I'm not sure that we came up with the answer. Uh, certainly is the I case that, that launch, well, orbital mechanics are complicated. <laughs> that was my answer, yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we definitely came to the agreement that it's a beautiful, adult, well, it's certainly orbital mechanics, where the space station is. Um, uh, is is important, and um, I think also probably weather might be in general the winds might be calmer at night um, by the ocean, but that's that's really just a guess. Um, it's not something that I've tracked closely. I don't know if you guys have it, talked about it internally. It is, and the c conditions are better at night. But it's exactly as you say. It, it does come down to where the space station is going to be and how they need to catch up with it. And so when we land at night, uh, the launch ends up happening at night. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And uh, that's why we're spending our entire overnight <laughs> getting <laughs> ready right. for this launch, <laughs> which it, it's interesting that they, they noticed that because Demo 2 and Crew 1, um, Crew 1 I'm a little fuzzy on, but I think yeah. those were daytime. But Crew 2, Crew 3, Crew 4, mm -hmm. all overnight. All overnight, that's right. But you notice that the Axiom 1 mission which uh, you know was just about two weeks ago, that was during the day. So, oh. you yeah. know, re it really so just really depends. So really, what I what I remember from year. shuttle days is that as the launch cha gets later, the time gets earlier by about 23 minutes or something like that, yes, day by day. Right. So you used to be able to do that launch math pretty quickly if you knew the mission had slipped a week, it was going to be so much earlier. So it really does have to do with where is the space station relative to the launch site, and you got to launch right when they're directly overhead, and that's exactly. that's how we do it. And it's an instantaneous window right. when it is overhead. And um, are we going to take another question? Let's do it. We have reached uh, an important milestone, as you can see on your screen, though, as we are watching outside the spacecraft, the Crew Dragon, Freedom, the uh, closeout crew there in the white room, appears to have the hatch shut, and now they're checking for leaks. And while they do that, let's take this, uh, this last question. Uh, what, what kind of food will the astronauts have on the International Space Station? So food is so important, as you can imagine. And Freedom SpaceX, with the side hatch now closed, we're going to be commencing health checks for the launch escape system. Expect moments, momentary flight computer state change, followed by transition back to pad hatch closed. And there's your confirmation. Uh, so, yes, food is so important um, for any long-duration mission, of course, but on the International Space Station, there are some challenges to providing a varied menu. You've got a lot of different people with a lot of different tastes, and then you have limited ability to keep fresh food fresh. 
So our food has to mainly be what we call shelf stable. So it's kind of like canned food, although our food comes in packets and it's also dehydrated food um, that we have to add water to. So the food lab at JSC works really, really hard to provide us that varied menu with lots of different flavors um, to try to help you know people with lots of different palates. And so my personal favorites, I like the mango fruit salad and um, chicken pineapple salad for a, a nice little bistro lunch with some tomato basil soup on the side. Those were some of my favorites, but a, a nice broad menu for lots of different um, taste buds. You are making me hungry. <laughs> but is, now, is that the rehydrated meal? Uh, so some of it's rehydrated and some of it's um, packaged, irradiated, basically, to become shelf stable. All right. Well, thank you very much, Megan, for taking those questions. And thank you to the audience for sending them in. We'll keep taking them as long as we're counting down here. And we've got about an hour and 48 minutes uh, left in the launch and then only an hour until the pad team wraps up its final checks and clears the white room. That's when the action will really pick up with the crew access arm retracting. Uh, then we'll have the arming of the launch escape system and then, of course, propellant loading. So we'll keep you uh, uh, live into the action, as you can see on the screen there, with the crew as they're sitting tight for the next hour or so. And then, of course, we'll provide you with some more context about this mission. But in the meantime, let's head over now to Houston for a closer look at what the crew will be doing when they reach their destination. Chelsea. Hey, thanks, Daryl. When Crew 4 arrives at the space station tonight, they'll officially become Expedition 67 flight engineers. Once on board, they'll do something known as a direct handover, just like what astronaut Megan MacArthur was talking about, basically saying that Crew 3 and Crew 4 will be aboard the space station altogether until Crew 3 comes home sometime next week. Crew 3 will be able to, sh to give Crew 4 an orientation, show them the ropes, which might be particularly helpful for first-time space flyers Jessica Watkins and Bob Hines. A direct handover also helps ensure a continuous U.S. presence on the space station, a record that we've held for almost 22 years. But the space station is an orbiting laboratory, and they'll jump right in on research investigations. So I'll toss it over to Megan Cruz, who can tell us a little bit more about those exciting experiments the Crew-4 will work on. Chelsea, thank you so much. Yeah, I want to introduce everyone to David Parker here. He's the European Space Agency's Director of Exploration. How are you? I'm great. Good morning <laughs> to you. You are very excited. Well, I do know why you're excited. This is your first launch from here at Kennedy. It is. It's incredible. I've been working in the industry for 30 years, and here I am, the first launch at Kennedy. That's so exciting. And you're going to watch uh, Samantha Cristoforetti's second trip to the International Space Station once she launches from here. When she gets there, she'll be working on a lot of science experiments, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, she'll be working in our uh, European lab aboard the space station, that's called Columbus, mm -hmm. and she'll be continuing many experiments that have been started, but some really interesting ones for her mission. For example, she's working on uh, DNA research uh, and related to aging, and that's related to one of our own interests, which is osteoporosis, the effects of aging back here on Earth. So mm. it's linking what we're doing aboard the space station to the research uh, that's really relevant to us back here on Earth. Yeah, and that's important because we do know that there is bone loss that happens while we have astronauts in space. Now, you know, something that's really interesting is that NASA and ESA aren't just partners when it comes to uh, our commercial crew program. You guys are playing a critical role in our return to the moon, NASA's Artemis program. Yeah, that's super exciting to us. Uh, I had the lovely opportunity yesterday to go into the VAB behind us oh. here and see the SLS rocket. We're super excited to be part of the Artemis program mm -hmm. because right at the top of the rocket is our first of our European service modules yes. the power and propulsion for the astronauts to take them back to the moon yeah. uh, and so the first one that was on top of that rocket the second one is already delivered to the states and we're building more maybe up to number seven eight and nine yeah uh, and of course the question is where the astronauts going to fly to well the first place will be the lunar gateway our mm -hmm permanent outpost around the moon a thousand times further out in deep space mm -hmm. than the space station. And so ESA is building two out of the three habitation modules. And what's really cool is one of them will be have the windows that allow the astronauts to look down onto the moon wow. exactly the what way the deal. astronauts on the space station look down from the cupola. Yeah, yeah, that's why international partnerships are so important. So we're so grateful to have you uh, as part of that Artemis program. And then I wanted to know, what does ESA hope to accomplish by returning to the moon? Well, there's a lot to do. I always say that the moon is the eighth continent of planet Earth, and it's an undiscovered country, really. In the days of Apollo, which I'm so old I remember, we kind of, I say the moon is a museum of, of four billion years of solar system history, and we just kind of went to the museum gift shop 
grabbed the souvenirs and came home again. Now okay. we're going to go there, really explore it, do the job properly this time, and un un unravel its secrets, what it can tell us about the whole history of our solar system. Mm -hmm. And with so much that we have ahead of us, you guys are really focused on STEM as much as we are here in the U.S. Oh, absolutely. And Samantha will do a lot of uh, outreach projects and education projects. Okay. For example, there's some really cool examples. We have a couple of tiny computers aboard the, our Columbus Laboratory, and school students will be challenged to produce software that they can upload, so they're doing their own software and research in orbit. Mm -hmm. I really can't get over the fact that this is your first launch from here at Kennedy. <laughs> I need to be right next to you when you watch this launch, because I think you're going to go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> as much as an English person ever goes nuts, yes. <laughs> well, perfect, David. Thank you so much for being here, and yes, I do hope you enjoy today's launch. Thank you so much. <laughs> Guys, back to you. All right, thank you, Megan, and looking forward to his reaction. He's going to stay composed, so he says. That's what he says. So we just heard about uh, the science from the European perspective, and now here's a closer look at some of the life-changing science that astronauts are performing aboard the International Space Station right now. The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art microgravity laboratory that is unlocking discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push farther into deep space. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. Microgravity turns almost everything we know upside down. Liquids behave completely differently. Fire burns in new ways. Biological systems reveal surprises. There's a few things that have made me gasp out loud up on board space station watching heart cells actually beat has been a pretty big one. We're studying ways to grow food in microgravity. I gotta tell you, these, uh, these are pretty amazing. We're learning how human bodies react to life in space and how to keep crew members safe and strong on long duration exploration missions. Deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. We're testing technologies that will be critical to our return to the moon and great leap to Mars. Our research has contributed to medical and social benefits on our home planet, allowing us to find new ways to combat disease back on Earth and develop technologies to deliver clean water to remote communities in need. The spectacular vantage point of more than 200 miles above our planet supports our monitoring of Earth's climate, natural disasters, and plant life. Our planet Earth is absolutely stunning. To me, it doesn't matter where we are in the world, I just see beauty in different ways. The growing new space economy, so vital to our continued progress in space, is flourishing in low Earth orbit. We're inspiring future generations from a platform that is one of the largest international collaborations of our time. We're doing science at 17,500 miles per hour. Come along for the ride. Some of the great science taking place on board the International Space Station. Got an operational update for you right now. The crew inside uh, Dragon there, Crew 4, received their post-ingress brief. The teams are tracking no issues at this moment. They also just completed communications checks with the key members of the Falcon 9 launch team. And now we are standing by for side hatch leak check completion. As you can see there on your screen, that is happening right now. Now, NASA astronauts on board the space station have been busy preparing for the arrival of Crew-4. I recently spoke to astronaut Raja Chari, who is in space right now, about how they're getting ready and the special connection he has with two Crew-4 astronauts. Raja, I covered your launch from Cape Canaveral, and I, I remember what you looked like then, and I see you now, and I'm just curious, did you get a haircut? And if so, how did you cut your hair in space? Yeah, so we've done a, a few haircuts. Uh, we use a uh, clippers with a vacuum hose attached to it. And so I can do about the, f the front half of my head, uh, basically just in the mirror, and then uh, usually use a crewmate to do the back side of my head. Hey, I can't help but notice you've got an inflatable uh, globe there attached to your leg, and I'm wondering what that's for. 
that is, uh, in case you have any questions uh, about the Earth, since uh, oftentimes people are curious about whether we can watch the launch and th uh, or see the orbital insertion. Uh, so obviously they'll be launching out of the Cape. Um, based on uh, where we're at, hopefully we'll have a decent view. And as long as we're on the, at least the half of the Earth that uh, can view the Cape, we might get a chance to see the, uh, the rocket uh, plume and maybe the insertion into orbit, but it's always kind of dependent on uh, atmospheric conditions and, and where exactly we are in the orbit in relation to their launch. We're getting ready to send Crew 4 to you. How are you getting ready for their arrival? But it's uh, funny you ask, because actually just yesterday we caught the visiting vehicle Cygnus, uh, the SS Pierce Sellers, and brought it on board the space station. And on board that uh, that space vehicle is a whole bunch of supplies for Crew 4. So uh, yesterday evening and today we've actually been unpacking it, and part of the supplies that it's brought up are food, clothes, uh, and other items for Crew 4. So we've been starting to distribute those around the station, uh, pre-position them for them, and then when it gets closer in time to them or showing up, we'll actually start to unpack those bags uh, and set up their crew quarters for them. Tell me a little bit about your experience, what you remember most about your launch day um, when you guys uh, launched from Cape Canaveral and went up to the space station, what, a little bit uh, about six months ago? Yeah, I think for me, the, one of the things that struck me uh, during the first stage uh, was just sort of the really visceral feedback you get in the, the rocket and how much, uh, how quick your senses are. The next thing is uh, that you really feel is the jolt between the first and second stage. So as the first stage uh, goes out, you feel uh, yourself kind of get weightless for a second, a few seconds of weightlessness. Uh, and then when the second stage lights, you get thrown backwards in your seat again, and then you feel that acceleration. And then the first spot of the space station, we uh, happened to see it as the sun was rising about 40 kilometers away, and the way the sun was hitting, it made it look like it was made out of gold. It was pretty cool. And so we just sat there mesmerized in the window watching uh, our new home get closer to us. Wow, that sounds incredible and uh, just a beautiful sight to behold it must have been. Thanks for sharing that with us. So. What experiments that you've been working on for the past few months have really stood out and, and you've enjoyed working on? Um, I'd say one of the ones I personally enjoy working on is some of the combustion experiments. And I think because uh, just the idea of, of fire and space is, are generally things you don't want to mix. And so you have to spend a lot of time and energy uh, when you design these experiments to contain the combustion because you don't want, obviously, that to get out into the atmosphere here. Um, but the, the rewards of that uh, research have led to things, uh, discovering cool flames and some potential to have much lower carbon emission processes on the ground uh, for combustion, of, you know, whether it's for cars or factories. And so the promise of it is, uh, is pretty amazing. Roger Chari, Expedition 66, NASA astronaut, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. And uh, have fun watching the Crew 4 launch. We'll be watching from here and can't wait to, to welcome Chell and the crew on board. Well, thanks to Raja Chari and the team at JSC for making him available. T minus one hour and 35 minutes and counting as you look out at the Falcon 9 rocket with the Crew Dragon Freedom at the very top, ready to launch in a little over an hour. Update on Rajachari, by the way, he has grown in a very thick mustache. So when you see him again, <laughs> he has taken the time. And apparently it's an Air Force thing. I think mustache march, march. is what he called it. Yeah. Pretty so, sure march is over, though. Yeah, so we'll, that's true. We'll he see said, where he's gone with that. Yeah, I, apparently he missed a couple weeks. Uh, and so okay. he, he's, he's on catch up. <laughs> um, but the other thing is he talked a little bit about watching a, a launch from the space station, which I just think is sounds really cool. Um, I wonder, you know, now we just got an update about the space launch system, our mega moon rocket, which now is looking in the August area for launch. Okay. Which crew four would be on board for that launch. But I understand you gotta be kind of lucky to see a launch from the space station. You do have to be kind of lucky. We have seen them and um, you just have to be, it's again, you know, kind of right place, right time, right? The trajectories have to be relative to one another correct. The lighting, of course, has to be correct. And then you kind of, just have to be looking in the right direction, right? There's a little bit of element of luck involved in it as well.
Um, and then also you can see some deorbit burns of vehicles going home again. And uh, my crewmate, Thomas Pesquet, did capture Crew One's deorbit burn really beautifully well oh. um, in, in some photographs in one of the very first nights that we were up there. So uh, kudos to him because I had not figured out how to even find a camera, much less take <laughs> night photography of a moving object. But um, So you do have some unique viewing opportunities. They don't always work out, but the team on the ground will usually tell us what they think those will be. Hope it works out for Crew 4. Crew 3, meanwhile, set to splash down next week. Megan, it seems like yesterday that you and your fellow Crew 2 astronauts splashed down. And I want to take a look back and take you back down memory oh, lane. Oh, yes. Remember that. <laughs> yes. You, uh, had, you were the first astronaut out yes. of the SpaceX uh, Dragon after splashdown, and, and there was your look. That it was a good moment. Um, it's a little bit painful getting out. You actually have this wonderful team who kind of just reaches in and hauls you out. There's some straps uh, uh, connected to your suit that they reach in and grab and haul you out, and they immediately you know, put you on a stretcher so they don't uh, want you standing up or trying to walk around. Everything kind of hurts at that point. Your back hurts and everything else. I was really grateful that I felt well. I did not feel any motion sickness or anything like that. Um, I was just really happy to see. I think I'm seeing Shannon Walker down the uh, down the end of the hall there. So I'm, I'm <laughs> getting a big smile from my friend. Shannon Walker, one of our uh, guest hosts for the previous launch, Crew 3. And Roger Chari and the rest of the Crew 3 team, of course, when they return from the International Space Station next week, um, it'll be a great moment, uh, just like the one we just saw there with uh, Megan MacArthur. NASA's Megan Cruz got to speak with Crew 3's mission manager as she balances the two missions and reflects on a busy couple of years here on the Florida Space Coast. This is Jessica Parsons with NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Jessica, it's so great to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. So this is where you will be on launch day, inside one of the launch control centers here at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. But your Crew 3 mission manager, how are you involved in Crew 4? Um, well, that's correct. I'm the Crew 3 mission manager, uh, but we have uh, a group of mission managers that is assigned to each of the missions. Mm -hmm. uh, for Crew 4, our mission manager is actually in the LCC room in Fire Room 4 uh, with the SpaceX and the spacecraft team. But we do have many teams that support from different locations. Hangar AE here is one location where we have our launch vehicle teams and our ground systems team that are following the launch preparations for the launch vehicle and the ground systems. So we do have mission managers assigned to different locations. Mm. And as a crew three mission manager, this is where I am since I'm not in the prime mission manager role. We also have uh, a group of engineers that support from the mission control center at JSC and some of the engineering teams there. Uh, with them, monitoring all the activities from launch all the way to docking. Gotcha. So what is your particular role on launch day here? Right, so launch day here, I am listening to the loops, uh, helping the team if there is any anomalies or any issues, being aware of what those issues are and reporting them up to the team, make sure they have the latest information. So our NASA operations manager, who is a voice within the SpaceX countdown, can be aware of those and report them if there's an issue. And why is it important for you as the Crew 3 mission manager to be so intertwined with Crew 4? Well, it is important because I need Crew 3, Crew 4 to launch successfully for Crew 3 to return home. Uh, as you know, we, uh, once Crew 4 gets into ISS, they will have a five day handover period, uh, with the Crew 3. And they, once that handover is complete, depending on the weather, we'll assess readiness for Crew 3 return and then we'll be coming home. How long have you been with the commercial crew program? So I would say I'm fairly new to commercial crew. I've been with them uh, for two years since we became operational. Actually, my first day at work was uh, uh, the week when we launched Demo 2. We were launching oh, wow. Bob and Doug. <laughs> so it was uh, craziness to me to experience that on my first week at the job. But since then, this is the fifth mission that we launched in that period of two years. So it's uh, an incredibly fast cadence. Uh, it seems like we launch a mission and then we have the next mission coming up, getting ready for it. So it's very exciting at the same time, very rewarding. Why do you say that, that this job is rewarding? Well, I think it's extremely rewarding because, you know, we are contributing to our space program. We are launching again astronauts from American soil, something that we hadn't done since the space shuttle program. And having this cadence, we're doing it every six months. So uh, it just keeps us excited and motivated to keep continue doing it. Yeah, very busy, exciting times here on the Space Coast. Jessica, thank you so much for being here with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Back to you.
Thank you, Jessica and Megan. And uh, she's looking forward to a launch of Crew 4 so she can bring Crew 3 home. And we are one hour and 29 minutes away from that happening. You see the crew now. That's a live shot inside the white room looking at the Dragon capsule. And we just got an update. We have a good side hatch leak check. And so the team there just uh, wrapping up the work as they continue progressing towards liftoff. Time now to check in on how the rest of the countdown is progressing. So let's send it back out to California and SpaceX's Andy Tran. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, yeah, as you just mentioned, uh, under 90 minutes now until liftoff, and uh, we saw that the hatch was closed, and we heard that the leak check was successfully performed. Uh, launch engineers are located in firing room four in the NASA Launch Control Center at Kennedy Space Center. They do have a view through the large windows that you see on screen of pad 39A, just about five kilometers east of them. The Falcon 9 team is loading helium and nitrogen gas into storage bottles on the launch vehicle. RF checkouts are also complete, and the final review of vehicle testing performed earlier today is underway. The SpaceX chief engineer will check with the team uh, at about the T-minus 80-minute mark to verify that we are still good to continue the countdown. The next major activity is flowing a small amount of fuel into the first stage to prime the Merlin 1D engines for ignition. The team is also monitoring fuel and liquid oxygen loading preparations, ensuring the propellants in the ground tanks are correctly chilled prior to loading them onto the Falcon at T minus 35 minutes. Weather and range continue to be green. Um, they have been green all night. Uh, so things again are looking uh, great as we've had a really just a great and smooth uh, countdown so far. With that, uh, I do wanna check in with Dan and Jesse who have a very special update for us. Hey, thanks, Andy. Now, before anybody climbs on board Dragon for a flight into space, they're going to spend a lot of time here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, where we've got a number of simulators, mock-ups, and things like that for them to familiarize themselves with the spacecraft. Now, before we dive into this one, Jesse's going to walk us a little bit more through the Dragon spacecraft. Yeah, just to get an idea of the size of Dragon, the capsule with the trunk attached to it is about 8.1 meters tall. Now, Dan, that's about three and a half times the height of Shaquille O'Neal. It's a lot of shacks. <laughs> The diameter of the vehicle is about four meters, and the payload mass that it can carry up to space is about 6,000 kilograms. So, Dan, just in case you wanted to bring a large African elephant with you to outer space, you totally could. <laughs> and the, the return mass is about half of that. It's about 3,000 kilograms when returning back to Earth. All right, and so SpaceX has a number of simulators, mock-ups for the different aspects of Dragon, and this one right here is a mock-up of the forward hatch. So this is on the very top part of the Dragon spacecraft, and this is what they'll be opening once they dock to move into the space station. Now, I'll walk you through it a little bit. So there's a crank right here, and there's an identical one on the other side. And there's a decal on here that tell you which direction and how to open this. So when you tune into docking tomorrow, you'll hear the crew get the call to open the hatch per the decal. So after we move the handle out, we can just start to open it up. There's a small indicator in the window that'll tell us just how close we're getting. And after we get it all the way down, we're gonna hear a telltale pop, and then it's time to open up the hatch. And so it opens up pretty slowly. Yeah, so now it may look like Dan is really struggling to open the door, but in fact, the hinges are designed with dampers so that the door does open pretty slowly. It's about seven seconds to fully open no matter how much you push or pull on the hatch door. And that's a safety precaution. Uh, the door opens up to the interior of the Dragon vehicle, so we want to make sure that the door doesn't swing and hit anything inside of the vehicle or harm anybody that's inside of the vehicle as well. And say same with closing. Again, it may look like Dan is struggling, but this is per design about seven seconds to fully close the hatch door. And so not just practicing how to open the hatch and close it, they can also practice attaching seals and covers to the hatchway. Uh, there's also a window here that you can look through out of the forward part of Dragon, and there's a pressure equalization valve that can be used to manually equalize pressure between Dragon and the space station. Yeah, and this is just one of the many components that our teams here get to do and be able to train the crew on. So if you're interested in any of the work here at SpaceX, please take a look at SpaceX.com slash jobs and check it out. Now we'll send it back to Kennedy. Uh, how's it going over there, Daryl? All right, it's going great, uh, Jesse. Thank you both for that uh, little show and tell there of the hatch. Megan, you were familiar with that. 
Absolutely. That was one of the uh, training items that we would use when we would go out to Hawthorne to make sure we understood how that mechanism worked. Weren't you saying that you did it faster? Is that what a little bit, maybe a little bit faster, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're currently T-minus one hour and 24 minutes and counting until Crew Dragon flies its next four-person crew to the International Space Station with the astronauts that you see. Uh, they're inside that spacecraft right there. Commander Chell Lindgren, Pilot Bob Hines, and Mission Specialist Jessica Watkins and Samantha Cristoforetti. We are getting ready to do the launch escape system checks. We've had the common leak checks. Those were successful. We closed the hatch. We got a secure seal on that, got that confirmed. And then we also have started to begin, started to begin those launch escape system and communication checks. That's all conducted by the Falcon launch team. These checkouts are a standard part of the launch countdown, and they're critical to make sure everything is in working order before arming that launch escape system. The launch escape system, of course, critical to the astronauts inside because this, once the crew leaves, is the only way to get off the pad if something were to go awry. That's right. It's one of the, in my opinion, one of the best features about this uh, transportation system is that you have a way to get the crew safely away from a rocket that might be experiencing an off nominal condition. And that capability exists from, you know, before you start the propellant load, you know, all the way into orbit. And so it's, a, it's one of the great capabilities that this vehicle brings. And that launch escape system is powered by Super Draco engines that are capable of moving Dragon a half a mile in only seven and a half seconds. That's pretty remarkable. That is booking it. I guess equivalent to a peak velocity of 436 miles per hour. I can imagine what that feels like. Well, fortunately, we have not had to experience that um, at this point. Um, but if it were necessary to get away, like I said, from a rocket that is um, having an off nominal event, um, that would sure be how fast you'd want to be moving. Exactly. Whether it's on the ground or traveling uphill. That's right. You can manually trigger that system as well, right? You can manually trigger that system and it can be triggered in response to a condition. Um, the ground would typically let you know uh, if they had time, but of course things can happen very quickly and mm -hmm. so it needs to be able to happen automatically as well. Crew 3 is scheduled to splash down next week. We talked a little bit about that and uh, Megan will be there. I will. Megan MacArthur? No, <laughs> but the ship that Megan was named after, oh, yes. Oh, look at that. Actually, the ship was named after you. The SpaceX's uh, seafaring vessel uh, that will be used to recover Crew 3 and the Dragon capsule was renamed after our own Megan MacArthur, who flew aboard Dragon, of course, on Crew 2. And this is the ship, beautiful inside. Previously, it was named Go Navigator. SpaceX <laughs> renamed the... Uh, ship Megan as well. They have another ship. They renamed it Shannon in honor of Shannon Walker, the first woman to fly on Crew Dragon. And look, Megan, your name look is even that, on, the, on, on the, the life preserver. On the life preserver. That's that's fantastic. What an honor. Um, I have not seen it in person yet. Of course, I have heard about it, and uh, I feel like that's a real honor. It's funny to me as an oceanographer that I flew in space, and that's what uh, got a ship <laughs> named after me for doing. Um, but it's a tremendous honor, and I'm really happy to be a, just a little part of that history. And hey, listen, the good ship Megan already picked up a crew. They, uh, they took the ship out there and uh, picked up the Axiom 1 crew, which landed just off the coast of Jacksonville. So already hard at work. Already an experienced ship. That's yeah. awesome. Yep. Well, hopefully you get to see it and get a selfie with it. Definitely. That's on my list. Speaking of history-making astronauts, we now have a special message, Megan, from one of the astronauts who flew Crew Dragon's first test flight. And the message is for our guest host, Megan MacArthur, and for the four astronauts of Crew 4. Take a listen. All right. Howdy, Megan. It's your husband, Bob. I didn't want you to miss the melodious sound of my voice while you were down in Florida giving commentary for Crew 4. I did want to wish you all the best and let you know that Theo and I are thinking of you and really looking forward to reliving both the Crew 4 launch and watching the Crew 3 splashdown together as a family when you return. For Crew 4... Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha, I wish you all the best. I know that you've trained really hard in preparation for this mission, and I'm, I'm expecting great things uh, from y'all while you're on board. 
I would give you one piece of advice, and that's to really enjoy that final meal and crew quarters that you get prior to heading out to the vehicle to strap on and launch into space. Doug and I really enjoyed ours, and I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about what you selected to eat prior to strapping on a rocket ship. You know, for me, it's hard to believe that it's been nearly two years since I launched on the Demo-2 mission to the International Space Station and had the opportunity to stay on board for just a few short months. Um, it almost seems surreal, uh, but I'm reminded every day by the great accomplishments that I see with the crews on board the International Space Station that uh, we achieved something, that it is real, and I'm just really looking forward to seeing what you guys, Crew 4, accomplish while you're on orbit. I wish you all the best and good luck. Bye, Megan. <laughs> wow. oh, that's a great message. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for surprising me with that. That's awesome. That's right. We were looking forward to this moment. Of course, that was Bob Benkin, Megan's husband and history-making astronaut from uh, Demo 2 uh, there with uh, a nice message for you and for Crew 4. Yes. Thank the funniest you. part was when he said, I know you missed the melodious <laughs> sound of my voice. The melodious sound of my voice, yes. Um, people often ask me, you know, since I flew on the same vehicle in the same seat after Bob in, in that uh, Crew Dragon Endeavor, you know, did he leave something for you on the spaceship? Did he leave something for you uh, on the space station? And what I like to tell people is he left me a fully functioning, safe spacecraft to get me to space and home again. And there's really no finer <laughs> gift than that when you're in the space flight business. I would greatly agree with that. Uh, the Let's now join uh, Megan Cruz, who is with Phil McAllister. He is the director of the Commercial Space Flight Division at NASA headquarters. Y'all take it away. That's right, Phil McAllister. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. So talk to me about this being the fourth crew rotational flight to the International Space Station. What kind of milestone does this represent? Well, it represents that we've been working on these vehicles for, it was 10 years in yeah. development. So now after all that development, we're actually flying and it's very gratifying. And to have four missions within two years, it's really kind of amazing. And it's really picked up the pace and uh, it's just what we were working for. Yeah, you know, reliable, a regular cadence. It's really amazing to see that, again, this program has only been around for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. yep. So then, you know, just a few weeks ago, we also saw Axiom 1 launch from the same launch pad that Crew 4 is about to launch from, you know, the first all private crew to the International Space Station. Is that the future? Are we gonna see more private commercial missions, maybe commercial space stations? Absolutely, I mean, that is our strategy. It was our strategy when we started Commercial Crew that we wanted to be one of many customers mm -hmm. and to see that actually come to fruition because there was a lot of skepticism about that in the very early days. We didn't really know how it was going to play out and now it seems pretty clear the demand for human space transportation is very strong and a lot of people um, are going to be able to experience this um, more and more which is kind of just what we were doing. Yeah, exactly. And what is the importance of fostering these commercial efforts in low Earth orbit? You know, NASA has so many other goals, but why is it important to still maintain this particular presence again in low Earth orbit? I think you said it is because NASA does have all these goals. If we maintained all the the footprint of what we had done in the past, we won't be able to go as far in the future and far right. out into the solar system as we want. So I think it's time for low Earth orbit that has now a little bit more routine of a mission. Mm -hmm. It's time to turn that over to the private sector. They've shown, the U.S. aerospace industry has shown both technically and financially that they are capable with NASA's help <laughs> of doing that mission and so that we can direct our, our resources towards the moon and Mars. Can you remember a busier time on the space, guys? I really can. <laughs> Not, I, you know, it's interesting. I was here for the last shuttle mission, and I remember being at the hotel, and they were all like, oh, no, this is the last shuttle mission. I don't know if we're going to be able to, to keep going. And now there's five more hotels, and you still can't get a, a, a place. So it's really been invigorating for, I think, this economy, the, the local um, economy, but also NASA. And partnering with these companies, we learn from them, they learn from us. I think it has really just invigorated uh, everybody. Yeah, just the last, within this month, we saw three vehicles on three different pads there. Can you remember when you last saw something No, like that? I cannot. <clears throat> this really is probably the busiest time that I can think of in, in my memory, for yeah. sure. I mean, the Axiom 1 uh, spacecraft came down less than two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're launching Crew 4, and Crew 3 is going to come back down four or five days after that. It's just what we've been working for. We want to fly, and so now we're doing it. Lots of juggling, but very worthwhile, very rewarding. Yes, when we complain about it, we were like, <laughs> what are we complaining about? This is actually our job, so it's nice to be flying. Phil, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. I hope you enjoyed today's launch. Thank you. All right, let's go back to Hawthorne for another check on the countdown. 
Thanks, Megan. Now we're just at T minus one hour and just under 15 minutes away from launch. And it just gets more and more exciting as we approach that T zero. Now we've been able to watch the crew uh, ingress the Dragon vehicle. They're already inside and there you can see on your screen. Uh, they were helped out by our closeout team. Uh, the closeout team helped to attach their umbilicals, which provide breathing air and comms to Dragon. Uh, they also performed uh, suit leak checks uh, as well as those uh, comm checks uh, with the core and launch director as well. Yeah, and after the suit leak checks were complete, we got the hatch closed and the closeout team was able to confirm that we got through a good side hatch leak check. So that was another really important milestone. There were also some communication checks with some of the key members in the Falcon 9 launch team. Uh, but coming up, the closeout team is going to get ready to depart. So we're going to see them move off of the, out of the white room, off the crew arm, and they're going to leave the area. And after they're gone, the only people left at that pad area are the astronauts. Uh, the final weather checks have just kicked off, releasing a couple of weather balloons. The good news is all of the weather has continued to look great Freedom. for launch. The closeout team has departed the crew arm. Freedom copies. Thanks. And there the core giving that update. So the, the closeout team has departed the crew arm. They're going to get in cars and drive away. And then it's just crew four on the pad, and that's it. And then we're going to get closer to launch. Again, weather's continued to look fantastic. Very low probability of violation at the launch site. And then our ascent corridor weather just all the way up the eastern seaboard of the U.S. Uh, has continued to trend all in the right direction. So we're not looking at any holds for a launch today. Yeah, and great news on that weather. Uh, we will also do a final go, no go poll. Uh, but before we get to that, the various teams at both NASA and SpaceX will do an internal go poll, making sure that conditions are right with Falcon 9, the Dragon, the crew, the range, and the space station before we before the final go is given. So now let's check back in with Houston for a status update on the team supporting the space station on the readiness for launch. Chelsea, how's it going over there? Hey, thanks, Jesse. The team here in Mission Control Houston has pulled that they are go for launch earlier. The International Space Station and its onboard crew are ready to for the crew for astronauts to lift off. When flight director Anthony Varia pulled his team, he was asking the flight controllers who all work on the different key systems on board the space station that their focus areas were online and working properly. This includes life support systems, proper communications links, computers that allow us to command the station's onboard subsystems, and our ability to control and maneuver the space station. All of those are fully functional. Uh, the crew in orbit is getting out of their sleep period now. They're just starting to wake up. And the, well, when the Crew 4 launches, this crew is actually going to be flying over Romania. That's where the space station will be at the time of launch. So how about that? Um, but as they're getting into their morning routine now at the time of launch, uh, they're going to make sure that they're refreshed and ready to receive the crew. But here in Mission Control Houston, we'll continue monitoring the mission as we check off milestones for today's flight. In the meantime, I'll send it back to Hawthorne. The International Space Station is ready for launch. Dan? Hey, thanks, Chelsea. So the Crew-3 astronauts are currently on board the space station. They've spent nearly six months conducting scientific research in a myriad of areas like material science, developing new health technologies, working on plant science, growing some pretty exciting plants on board the space station, microgravity, just a lot of different sciences. We prepare for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and also to deliver benefits to us back here on Earth. And all of that research just lays the groundwork for that future exploration that we're aiming towards to the moon and Mars, starting with the agency's Artemis missions. Yeah, Chari is the commander of the Crew-3 Crew Dragon spacecraft and the Crew-3 mission. He is responsible for all phases of flight from launch to reentry. He's currently serving as an Expedition 67 flight engineer aboard the station. The Crew-3 launch was the first space flight for Chari, who was selected as an, an, a NASA astronaut candidate in 2017. Now, he was born in Milwaukee, but considers Cedar Falls, Iowa, his hometown. And also on board was NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn. He's the pilot of the Crew Dragon spacecraft, essentially the second in command for the mission while they're in free flight. He's responsible for the spacecraft systems and its performance. Right now, though, on board the station, he's the commander of Expedition 67. 
Uh, and Marsh Fern, a native of Statesville, North Carolina, became an astronaut back in 2004. Crew 3 was his third visit to the space station and his second long duration stay on the laboratory. Barron was selected as an astronaut candidate in 2017 and is a mission specialist for Crew-3. She works closely with the commander and pilot to monitor a spacecraft during the dynamic launch and reentry phases of flight. She's currently serving as a flight engineer for Expedition 67 aboard the station. Barron was born in Pocatello, Idaho, but considers Richland, Washington her hometown. And rounding out Crew-3 was Matthias Maurer, who was also a mission specialist for the Crew-3 mission. And again, working with the commander and pilot to monitor the Dragon spacecraft during all of those different dynamic phases, launch and re-entry, docking and undocking. Uh, he's also a flight engineer on Expedition 67. And like uh, Raja Chari and Caleb Barron, this was his first trip to space. Uh, and he was from St. Vendel in the German state of Saarland. So that four-person crew is currently on board. They're preparing for Crew 4's arrival, uh, but their return back to Earth is just days away, assuming we get an on-time launch today. So looking forward to seeing all of them on board the space station together. Let's get back to the countdown now. We'll head over to Daryl at the Kennedy Space Center. Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Dan and Jesse. And if you're just now joining us, welcome to coverage for the mission known as Crew 4, NASA and SpaceX's fourth flight of astronauts to the International Space Station. We are currently at T minus one hour and eight minutes until liftoff. Liftoff time still holding Megan for five, I'm sorry, 352 Eastern time, 352 and 55 seconds. That's where the five's coming from. <laughs> and we're tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon. The range is green, weather is cooperating. And over the last three hours, our crew of Jell Lindgren, Bob Hines, Jessica Watkins, and Samantha Christopheretti have donned their SpaceX space suits in the historic crew quarters suit up room. Then they walked out of the crew quarters building as every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7. Then they were transported to the pad where they climbed inside the SpaceX Crew Dragon Freedom. And now we are seeing them live on that rocket that you see on your screen right there, awaiting liftoff. And so Megan, as they wait for this, what is the crew doing in these moments? Right, the, the closeout crew is leaving and so it's just the astronauts inside the spacecraft. Yes, you certainly realize as that hatch closes and you get the call that uh, everyone's left the pad, that you're, you're getting very, very close to launch. Um, throughout the time, and it is a significant amount of time that they're in there and waiting. In the beginning, you know, when you first arrive, you want to make sure that if you, if you had to do an emergency egress, you know what all of the functions are that you need to do, um, what are all of the equipment is, and so you take some time to be serious about thinking through all of that. You know, and as we go further and we approach the propellant loading, they're going to, again, be very much focused focused on the tasks at hand. But in between, there's quite a lot of downtime. And so they'll be entertaining each other, telling stories. Maybe they'll be playing some games. The, the few glimpses that we've had of them, I've seen some smiles on faces. So I think they're in there having fun, getting ready. Plenty of smiles from Crew 4, indeed. We've seen that, and it's been good to see. Over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch. Um, the crew will also arm the launch escape system and the fueling of the Falcon 9 will begin and that's a big moment let's talk about today's flight launch of course is set for 352 and 55 seconds a.m eastern daylight time this will include a 12 minute flight to orbit and then a roughly 16 hour flight to dock with the international space station at 8 15 p.m tonight eastern daylight time all in one day yes it is a long day you know when i think about them getting ready to fly I think about the story that I've heard you tell about that flight uphill. You'd gotten, you know, past the tough part, right? You've lifted off, crew two is in space, and you felt like everything was okay. And then there was this sudden alarm. Yes. Can you recount that story? Sure. Well, actually, it was uh, kind of, you know, again, a very long day. You're exhausted for a lot of reasons. And it was at that time our bedtime. And so we'd been given the go to dress into our pajamas, pull out our sleeping bags, and, and basically hunker down and try to get as much sleep as you can before the rendezvous begins the next day. And um, we got the call from Sarah, our core, to say, hey, we're tracking an object um, that's potentially going to get too close to you. We need you immediately back in your suits and put everything away. You have, I think it was 15 or 20 minutes. And so 
Wow. That was an immediate scramble to do exactly what she had said. There was no time to really think about it. We had to just go right into the drill of practicing those motions that we had done, of course, um, at home. And um, our awesome mission specialist, Aki and Tama, got Shane and I into our suits and strapped into our seats and then got themselves suited and then had to put absolutely everything away, every T-shirt, every sleeping bag, every sock, everything. Um, and that was a tremendous amount of work under time pressure. And just as they got the last, you know, zipper zipped and buckle buckled, we got the call that said, it was a false alarm and there was not actually an object out there uh, on a trajectory with us. So it did feel a lot like the simulator that the Sim Soup had just maybe seen uh, that we were uh, done with the task and was ready to move on to the next thing. Wow. But it was a good it was a good practice. It got our hearts racing. What <laughs> an experience thinking you might hit something in space, but actually yep. it was a false alarm. It was something that was improperly uh, entered into the system. There was nothing there. That's right. But uh, you trained for that for that. Right. And you were ready for it. We were. Thank you for sharing for that. Sure. All right, let's check in now with uh, Hawthorne and uh, go out to California for a status on both vehicles. Andy, what do you have for us? Thanks, Daryl. We've had a smooth countdown so far, and the SpaceX team is working no issues as the pace begins to pick up. Uh, we heard that the crew uh, had left uh, the pad, and so right now uh, it's just the crew inside Dragon. For Falcon 9, our two-stage reusable rocket, final propulsion checkouts of the first and second stages, and the engine began uh, just a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. Now, this involves testing and cycling valves, uh, as well as engine uh, pneumatics pressurization. At the T-minus 45-minute mark, the team will report their readiness for propellant load with a final electronic go-no-goal pull. Now, before we, we can begin starting to load propellants on Falcon 9, we do have a few more tasks to perform. First, we need to retract the crew access arm away from the Dragon capsule uh, to its launch position. That's going to happen between the T-44 and the T-42 minute mark. With the arm out of the way, the launch escape system will be armed, and once these two events are complete, Dragon will be ready for Falcon propellant loading. We'll also verify with the launch weather officer that weather meets all the constraints. Uh, these include items such as wind speed, lightning, and precipitation. We do expect acceptable weather conditions for launch at both the surface level and upper altitudes, though. Range is currently clear for launch uh, from historic launch pad 39A, worldwide network of ground stations, and the tracking and data relay satellites are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. Today, we do have an instantaneous launch window at 3.52 a.m. Eastern Time. Once we begin loading propellant, there is no opportunity to change to T0. The timing for Dragon to rendezvous with the International Space Station is very precise, down to the, down to the second. So we do only get one chance at it today. The good news is uh, we are uh, at T minus one hour and one minute and counting. Everything is looking green. So I'm going to send it back over to Jesse. That's great news, Andy. Thanks for the update. Today's launch marks the fourth time a rotational crew will fly on a commercial spacecraft, and each of our crew members brings a diverse set of experiences to today's flight. Chell Lindgren is commander of Crew Dragon of the Crew Dragon spacecraft and the Crew 4 mission, responsible for all phases of flight from launch to reentry. Chell spent most of his childhood abroad and returned to the U.S. to earn a doctorate of medicine from the University of Colorado. Board certified in emergency medicine, Chell served as the deputy crew surgeon for STS-130 and Expedition 24. He also flew on Expedition 44 and 45, logged 141 days in space, participated in two spacewalks, and more than 100 different science experiments on station. And Bob Hines is the pilot of Crew Dragon Freedom today, and he's going to be responsible for spacecraft systems and performance, and he's second in command for the mission. He's also going to serve as a flight engineer for Expedition 67 and 68 on board the station. He was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, earned a Bachelor of Science degree in aerospace engineering from Boston University. After he graduated from there, went to the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School, where he was awarded a Master of Science in Flight Test Engineering, and then went on to complete a Master of Science degree in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Alabama. A lot of school. In 2012, he was selected as a research pilot at NASA's Johnson Space Center, and then in 2017, got the call to become an astronaut candidate. 
Jessica Watkins is a mission specialist for Crew 4. This will be Jessica's first trip to space following her selection as an astronaut in 2017. As a mission specialist, she will work closely with the commander and pilot to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and reentry phases of flight. Jessica earned a bachelor's degree in geological and environmental sciences from Stanford University and a doctorate in geology from the University of California, Los Angeles. At the time of her astronaut selection, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology, where she collaborated as a member of the science team for the Mars Science Laboratory rover, Curiosity. And our fourth crew member, Samantha Chris Ferretti, also a mission specialist for Crew 4 from the European Space Agency. In 2001, she graduated from the Technical University of Munich, Germany, with a master's degree in mechanical engineering with specializations in aerospace propulsion and lightweight structures. And she also attended the Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training Program at Shepard Air Force Base in the U.S., where she earned her fighter pilot wings in 2006. She was selected as an ESA astronaut in May 2009, and then in November 2014, launched from the Cosmodrome in Baikonur, Kazakhstan, before returning to Earth in June of 2015 after spending 200 days in space. Then in 2019, she went on a different mission, NASA's 23rd Extreme Environment Mission Operations, also known as NEMO, a 10-day stay in the world's only undersea research station, Aquarius. Each of these four crew members will join Expeditions 67 and 68 once they arrive at the International Space Station. All right, well, we are under an hour away from launch, so we're getting into really the exciting part of the countdown. We heard that the crew, uh, the closeout crew has left the arm, they're out of the area, uh, and we're getting closer to propellant loading and some of the really exciting moments. Uh, SpaceX's Crew 4 mission is the company's fifth crewed space flight for NASA. We had the Demo 2 test flight and three previous operational crewed missions to station. Uh, this is also SpaceX's seventh crewed space flight overall. Uh, including the uh, Inspiration4 mission, as well as the AX-1 mission, which just recently came home. Today, our crew is flying the newest Dragon in our fleet, and we'll be taking a ride on board the Falcon 9 that supported the CRS-22 mission in June of last year. Now, it's been a great countdown so far. As Andy has been saying, weather has been looking really good for T-Zero, and again, the excitement just continues to pick up as we get closer to the T-Zero mark. Yeah, it's gone really smoothly so far today. If you joined us at the very beginning, we started with suit up just over three hours ago, where the SpaceX team helped the crew put on their suits that they're going to wear for all of the launch operations and did the initial checkouts, suit leak checks before they got to the crew walkout. And that's where Chell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha gave some final goodbyes and some waves to folks gathered outside the operations and checkout building before they climbed into the Teslas and began that roughly 20-minute ride out to pad 39A. And we did watch as the crew boarded their Teslas and headed down the NASA causeway, headed towards the launch pad. Once they arrived at the pad, the crew took a moment to enjoy the view of the vehicle. They will be taking flight on this morning and then headed up to fix service Freedom structure. SpaceX, we are cycling orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure. Just some comms there between the crew and the ground. Um, and again, as they uh, headed up the fixed service structure, they began the process known as crew ingress, and that's where the astronauts entered the Dragon spacecraft. The SpaceX team then performed a series of checks to ensure the suits, seats, uh, and vehicle interactions were all functioning properly. Yeah, they, they made their way two at a time down, uh, down that crew access arm and then getting in one at a time into the Dragon spacecraft. We saw Shell and Bob make the walk down first, followed soon after. Uh, by Samantha uh, and Jessica, uh, and uh, they were helped into the vehicle by that closeout team, which uh, a little while ago we did hear that they made their way off the crew access arm. Uh, they were able to close the hatch with the crew safely inside, execute the hot side hatch leak check, um, and so we're, we're less than an hour to go now. And so things are going to start to really pick up. Um, as we go through a series of go-no-go no, go poles to arm the launch escape system and then start propellant loading. 
The crew poll for readiness was completed at the T-minus 60-minute mark, and the Dragon poll for prop loading uh, is coming up here at about T-minus 55 minutes. And then after that, we'll be at T-minus 45 minutes. There will be an internal mission control hot run poll. SpaceX, at this time, you are go for Section 6. I can, when you're ready, please report go for launch. Freedom is go for section six and uh, put that to work. Again, just pausing for those comms between the core and the crew for astronauts. At T minus 45 minutes, we will have an internal mission control Hawthorne poll and then the launch director's poll for propellant loading. Now, when we get to about the T minus 40 minute mark, the crew access arm will retract and the crew will get the call to close their visors and to arm the launch escape system. Now, that's the automated safety system in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket, either on the pad or during the flight on the right uphill. And then once we reach 35 minutes before liftoff, propellant loading for Falcon 9 will begin loading fuel and oxidizer on both the first and second stages on Falcon 9. So we'll continue to get views of the crew. They're going to get ready to report their readiness for launch. Uh, they're in their suits throughout this entire phase. Um, but for right now, we are just standing by um, for these final pulls, and then we'll get into propellant loading. So with things starting to pick up, let's send it back now to the teams in Florida. Over to you, Daryl. All right. Thank you, Dan. And since we last saw you, our team has grown. Check this out. <laughs> the... <laughs> so Megan MacArthur and I want to welcome a group of NASA social participants onto our Happy launch freedom. broadcast. They are standing behind us and all around us. Guys, welcome. So you might ask, what are NASA social participants? This is them, and they are stoked, and here's what they've been doing. NASA puts out an open invitation to social media influencers who engage in STEM and science communication to come out to Kennedy, and you're looking at the pictures of some of the stops they went to around Kennedy. They tour this multi-user spaceport in the days leading up to launch, and it ends with a rocket launch. Uh, uh, they get to see it as close as you can possibly get, the same distance that the media and VIPs get to watch it. So I know you guys are excited about that. NASA social participant Camille Calabeo is otherwise known as the Galactic Gal on Instagram. And so you're here as, with, with all of your NASA participants, and I, I wanna ask, first of all, how's it going so far? It has been absolutely amazing. Um, so this is actually my first NASA social. I started my platform during COVID, so mm. you know we haven't had NASA socials since then. Um, and it has been absolutely incredible. I know we had a delay, um, and so you know some of us went home, some of us stayed. Uh, we got to come back. We got to see so many things, and I have gotten to meet so many wonderful people from all different walks of life. And you know, some of them are artists, some of them are foodies, some of them are space influencers. And so it's just been really phenomenal to be here and get to experience this with everyone. Absolutely, and each one of you represent a substantial audience that you're communicating with and sharing the science, which we appreciate so much. So we're so glad that you're here to do that. What's been the favorite part that you've done so far? That is a really hard question. <laughs> um, everything has been absolutely amazing, of course. Um, but I think the best part for me has been or was getting to see three different rockets on their pads at the same time. And it really just solidified to me what a time to be alive, right? Mm -hmm. You see SpaceX with Starlink, then you see SpaceX with Crew Dragon, and then you see SLS and Orion taking us back to the moon. And that was just really incredible to see that right here with my own eyes. Totally. And you guys get you know, got lucky, really, because there was a launch last week. You've seen two launches. We have yeah. national, NASA socials that don't get to do that. Yeah. So good on you for seeing that. What is one of the more challenging aspects, would you mm. say, to communicating science in this day and age? Yeah, I think um, communicating science on social media is challenging for a couple of different reasons. But I think one of them is that people just don't have uh, long attention spans anymore, mm. right? You get 30 seconds of people's attention a lot of times. So most of my content is actually on TikTok and those types of really short videos, and you get 30 seconds. And that's really hard to communicate effectively, educationally, um, and engaging, right? You have to engage your audience and keep them engaged for those 30 seconds that you get. Um, and I think for, for space specifically, it's challenging because space can be criticized a lot. 
um, especially from the general public that might not be otherwise connected to space. And so I think just really communicating why are we doing this and why it's really important to humanity and life on Earth. All right, well, the Galactic Gal, I want to give you an opportunity to ask a question of a NASA astronaut, Megan MacArthur, <laughs> put you on the spot. Oh, you put me on the spot. What one question would you ask an astronaut? Okay, so this might be cliche, but I'm sure we have a lot of young people watching, and I would really love to hear from your perspective as a female astronaut, um, what is something that you would recommend to somebody, say, five years old? Well, I think what I recommend to kids of any age and any gender is to figure out what it is that you love to do. Mm -hmm. Be curious mm -hmm. and try new things, right? Don't decide just one thing. At five years old, I'm going to do this one <laughs> thing, right? Because there's so many other amazing experiences to have. So be curious, ask lots of questions, find that thing that you love to do, and then pursue it and, and get really good at it. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, while we have all of these social media influencers here, for we want to reach out to our social media influencers and people are using it out there in the audience throughout the show. We've been taking your questions at the hashtag AskNASA uh, throughout the night. We have time for a few more before Falcon 9 fueling begins. And you can see it in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. This one for Megan. While on the space station, what was your biggest accomplishment? That's a tough one. I think for me, um, meeting the challenge of every single day, meeting the schedule every day and whatever that brought was really the challenge because every single day was different. Um, some days were easier than others. Some days were really hard. Some days you really had to lean on your crewmates. Some days you really were helping out your crewmates. Um, so it was that maintaining that even keel for the entire 200 days. And I'm calling it 200 days. <laughs> um, a record. I think was the bit was the biggest challenge. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. And so to imagine for me, like what was the most funnest thing about space? Floating around. Oh gosh. I mean, this woman was floating around in space. You know, it's the it's the camaraderie, right? It's this it's the silly times that you have with your crewmates, the ideas that you come up with. One day, um, Aki and I took our zero G indicator, which was a baby penguin, and I taped it to a balloon that I had blown up and then released. And so then the balloon, of course. <laughs> He was slingshotting all over the inside of the U.S. lab with this pe tiny penguin, you know, with his flippers up and he's zooming around. So stuff like that when you have some downtime, you know, it's a, it's a little bit science experiment. It's a lot fun and it's really great uh, team building. So it's all of those things at once. And it's a lot of hard work as well very, because the astronauts are doing a tremendous amount of research there. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later in the show, dive into the ISS, uh, ISS stuff that's going on right now and in the future. But for the moment, we want to thank our entire NASA social team for Crew 4 being here. Hey. Y'all are fantastic. Hey. Oh, very good. Let's now check back in with Andy at SpaceX in California. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, it is T minus 47 minutes and counting. The SpaceX launch teams are finishing final review of data from checkouts of Falcon 9 over the last hour. The launch director is about to pull the team for readiness, both to load propellant and to launch. Uh, and the exciting thing is this is the last pull before we lift off. The seven SpaceX engineers indicate they are go by electronically voting on the online countdown procedure. The launch director also checks in with Dragon mission director and NASA launch manager to make sure that they are also ready. Earlier you saw the vehicle assembly building called the VAB. The Falcon and Dragon launch team as well as key NASA launch members are in the launch control center adjacent to that VAB. They have a view straight towards pad 39A um, and they're able to see Falcon 9 and Dragon the team is ready for crew through the large windows of Fire Room 4. And launch. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and then approve of boarding the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operator shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. In the event of a fire alarm, key operators noted below will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personnel safety is threatened, evacuate to the south-facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the crew for movement. Awesome. So we heard at the very end uh, of that there that we are proceeding with the crew arm uh, movement. Um, so that access arm that is... Uh, adjacent to the vehicle, that's going to start to uh, move to its launch All position. operators in Fire Room 4 and MCCX, 
The control will be in a lockdown state until launch escape system is disarmed. It does take a few minutes for the crew access arm to fully retract, and after that, we'll be arming the launch escape system. So on screen, you can see the Dragon capsule with the crew access arm still in the surface position. Uh, the crew is crew on board. Crew retraction has started. So great, we got an amazing shot of the crew access arm retracting away from the Dragon capsule. So again, this is going to take a few minutes to fully retract, and then the next major activity is going to be arming that launch escape system uh, of the Dragon vehicle. So far, weather and range continue to be go for launch. Uh, we are monitoring the clearance area around the launch pad as well as air and sea space around the flight corridor. Here at Kennedy Space Center, the conditions are predicted to be acceptable for liftoff just uh, about 43 minutes from now. So with that, uh, again, everything is going smoothly on today's countdown. So I'm going to send it back over to you, Daryl. How are things going? All right. Thank you very much, Andy. And uh, the countdown clock continuing at uh, T-minus 43 minutes and counting. want to recap a few things here for you. The closeout team. Uh, they have left the white room and exited uh, the blast danger area. They are no longer in the picture there that you see. Also, SpaceX teams have pulled go for the LES arm and prop load. That's the launch escape system. And SpaceX Dragon Freedom reports go for launch. And so here we are at T-minus 42 minutes and counting. We're standing by for the next major milestone. We saw the crew access arm retract, and that's one of the last major visual milestones that we'll see in preparation for liftoff. And then shortly thereafter, we'll hear- Crew access arm retraction is complete. And there is the call out that the crew access arm retraction is complete. And so now we're looking towards propellant load. Megan, the propellant loading into uh, the Falcon 9 rocket, this is a big moment. Uh, not a lot of rockets load propellant with astronauts inside right. the crew capsule. That's right. This was a, a new capability um, that was developed for this vehicle to reduce, I think, overall the timeline. And it's something that the combined teams looked at very closely together from a safety perspective uh, during the development of this vehicle. It's one of the reasons why the launch escape system is so crucial to have that arm. This is a very dynamic activity that's happening. And so we want to be able to keep the crew safe in the event that something off nominal happens. So that's... Um, that launch escape system being armed is, is coming up, and that's definitely something that I remember the Demo 2 crew telling us to expect, you know, a loud noise associated with that pressurization of those lines. And so that is something that we were ready for and expected. How about that? You could hear the pressurizing of those uh, Draco engines? Yeah, it didn't. It was a, um, not quite instantaneous, but a short duration, very loud sound is what I recall of pressurizing of those Freedom lines. Freedom SpaceX for launch escape. At this time, I can give you a go for Section 7, close visors, and arm launch escape system. Okay, Freedom copies. Our visors are closed, and we are arming the launch escape system. So what does he do to arm that? Um, it's a, a, a command that is sent to make that a, a valid um, exit strategy. And as the pilot, you're there next to the commander, mm -hmm. keeping your eyes on all the systems? Basically, yeah, agreeing with him when he's sending commands that that's the correct thing to be doing. When that propellant is loading, 
Can you tell? Can you hear it? So I uh, I thought a lot about that and kind of pulled my crewmates and other people I know that have flown. Bob says that he recalls a, a gurgling sound. Huh. What I recall is more of like a whirring and clicking of the valves moving. So I think everybody's recollection is slightly different. Mm. And I had a similar experience on my shuttle flight. Dragon, that my SpaceX launch escape system is verified armed. All right. Ready to pop these papers. Uh, my memory of the sounds that occur on the spaceship are not as good as my visual memory. And so I think everybody remembers, you know, a slightly different overlapping set of things. And so we just heard that call out, uh, Megan, that the launch escape system is armed. Yes. And now that paves the way for the loading of propellant. That's right. The propellant, of course, super chilled liquid oxygen and RP-1 which is a refined kerosene for space flight. A look from high above, from the launch tower down onto the Crew Dragon spacecraft and rocket below. That booster getting ready to fly for the fourth time. We got the LES call a little early, so as far as the schedule is concerned, we're running ahead. But we're in a good place because propellant load starts at T minus 35 minutes. And the crew will, while they're not actively involved in the propellant loading activities, they're going to be pretty closely monitoring you know, when the different activities start. Um, loading the specific tanks with the specific um, propellants so that they can have a sense of where the vehicle is um, at every moment. A live look there line. at the base of pad 39A, the launch tower, and the strong back, which is part of the transporter erector. It is in the foreground. The rocket Falcon is just 9 behind. Propellant tanks will be venting for propellant load in approximately one minute. Okay, there you heard in 60 seconds venting those tanks in, in, a, in advance of the propellant load. It's 3.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time here on the Florida Space Coast. The overnight launch will light up the night sky here in Florida. The spacecraft at the very top, it's a new one. Crew Dragon Freedom, named by the crew. Although parts of it are being reused. The um, heat shield, the material from the heat shield. It's the first time they've used the composite heat shield structure, uh, reused it on a Dragon, which is just another advancement in SpaceX's our reuse capability. We're able to put uh, flight loads on it to test it and qualify it. NASA has approved it and it's ready to go, which is interesting because it's seen the saltwater environment, right? Right. But they found a way to um, get that ready for another go. Yeah, it is. It's remarkable. And that qualification program that you mentioned, very strict. Obviously, it has to be very thorough with multiple teams of people making sure that all of the requirements are met. Um, so that there are no safety impacts to reusing these pieces of hardware. But what, how transformative, really, to be able to use, reuse pieces that in the past would not have ever been used again um, to really bring down the efficiencies and the costs um, and ultimately the reliability as we are able to use flight-proven hardware over and over again. Absolutely. And now here we are just a few seconds away from propellant load. Thinking about the Crew 2 mission as we look forward to Crew 4. When you were up on the space station, it was quite the time up there, right? <laughs> you had 
I'm thinking about the the visit from the Russian film crew. That, we did that was have there shooting some visitors. A, a movie. That's right. That's right. So they came up. Uh, an, an actor and a producer came up on a Soyuz um, and spent the 10 day time period filming uh, a movie, uh, almost exclusively on the Russian segment. Um, but we were able to interact with them in the evenings. We would occasionally have dinner parties as we do up there, and so we would get to to chat with them a little bit and hear about their lives and hear about their plans. Was that interesting? It was very interesting. They were lovely people. They were a very gracious Our guest. Propellant load has started. There you hear the call out. The propellant load has begun. A big milestone. As we are sitting at T minus 34 minutes and counting, but you were saying, Megan, Yes, yeah, so it was. It's nice to have some new faces, quite frankly, yeah. and, to, and to hear some new stories. Um, and like I said, though, we really did not work with them. They worked exclusively on the Russian segment, um, and so it did not disrupt our ongoing science work that, of course, we're doing. That's so important for for our international partners. So um, I think it would be difficult to to carry out a movie production as well as carry out the actual work of the space station. Just another example of the, uh, you know, continued private use of the International Space Station, and I guess you didn't photobomb their, their shot? <laughs> I did not, no. I stayed okay. safely behind the camera, <laughs> or in the other room entirely. We're, we are now T-minus 33 minutes, 57 seconds, and counting away from the second launch of a Crew Dragon with people on board in 2022. Today we'll begin the next six-month rotation mission to the International Space Station. The launch escape system is armed. That happened just before we started loading the propellant onto Falcon 9. The Dragon capsule, though, it, it was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road at a facility SpaceX calls Dragonland. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer. So for the fuel, SpaceX uses monomethyl hydrazine, or MMH, and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for its oxidizer, and together, those propellants feed the Draco engines that maneuver Dragon on orbit, as well as the eight Super Draco engines that would power the launch escape system in an abort scenario. And now that fueling for Falcon 9 has started, that means the eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to pull this capsule away from the Falcon 9 rocket in an instant should there be any kind of emergency associated with a rocket on the pad, or if there was a problem with the pad. The NASA and SpaceX teams have trained extensively for exactly uh, that type of contingency, and they are ready. Now let's head over to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for an operations update. Andy? Thanks, Daryl. Uh, yeah, we are continuing to count down those final minutes and everything is still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon for an on-time liftoff just about 32 minutes from now. Uh, at the T-minus 35 minute mark, we heard that propellant loading began on Falcon 9. This is going to continue until about the T-minus 2 minute mark. The first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is fuel loaded into a tank at the bottom of the stage, and the other is an oxidizer loaded into a tank at the top of the stage. The fuel we use to power the Merlin engines is a refined kerosene referred to as RP-1. The oxidizer loaded on each stage is a densified liquid oxygen. We also refer to that as LOX. Densified means it is kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles and takes up less volume. And this basically allows us to uh, store more oxidizer uh, into both of the stages. To ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use an ignition fluid called TTAB. When TTAB comes into contact with oxygen, it burns, giving off a green colored flame. Once we have the flame going, we'll add the kerosene fuel into the Merlin chamber and the engine wraps up to full power. Now, if you pay close attention, you might see the green flash as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation about two and a half minutes into flight. Topping off helium into pressure vessels on both stages is also underway. This is used to pressurize the tanks in flight as propellant is pulled out by the Merlin, Merlin turbo pumps. On board the spacecraft, the astronauts are monitoring systems while propellant is loaded onto the Falcon 9. 
Again, uh, as Megan had mentioned, the crew training in the simulator included playbacks of sounds recorded in the Dragon capsule during a, uh, during recent flights. So uh, this should be the sounds that the astronauts are hearing should be sort of familiar. Uh, range and weather, again, uh, as they have been all night, are really tracking green. Uh, we're really continuing to report no problems, and um, uh, there really is a very low probability of violation for weather. As a reminder, today is an instantaneous launch window, so at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we'll have to stand down and our target backup launch opportunity tomorrow night, uh, just under 24 hours from tonight's planned launch. For now, uh, let's turn it over to uh, Jesse and Dan for an overview of events after liftoff. Great. Thanks, Andy. Again, always great news with some good weather. Uh, just under 30 minutes uh, to T0 today. So for crew four, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 16 hours. And as we await that launch time, just about 29 and a half minutes from now, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks, ensuring that both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. And you're looking now just over the shoulders of our team out at the Cape there as they prepare for liftoff. As we wait for the launch clock to hit zero, though, we wanted to give you a quick overview of what the ascent portion of this mission is going to look like. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. One of the first things that happens about 50 seconds into the flight, those nine Merlin engines will throttle down as the rocket passes through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. It's max Q. It's really the maximum amount of stress that the vehicle is going to hit on its way uphill. Also worth noting, when we hit max Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we are through that period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle down our nine Merlin engines again. And from there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. Yeah, all just right on top of each other. The first one's Miko, or main engine cutoff. That's where all nine of those Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is the second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second. The first stage starts to make its way back to Earth for a landing as the second stage ignites its engine and continues its journey with that third event, that engine ignition. It's called SES-1, or second stage engine start number one. That's where we'll see the MVAC engine light up and propel the second stage along with the crew four astronauts into orbit. And as stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back down to Earth. The first is the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine M1D engines will reignite and then shut down again. Now that helps to slow the stage down in preparation for re-entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. And while the first stage is heading back towards Earth, again, that second stage, it just continues to carry them into orbit until it cuts off its one Merlin engine that was ignited after stage separation. And once that happens, we wait for the call out and the confirmation of what's called a good orbital insertion, just essentially there where we expect them to be in outer space. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. Now, the landing burn is just a single engine burn that's powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to touch down and land on our drone ship about nine and a half minutes into the mission. And while Falcon 9's first stage is landing, Dragon is just getting ready to separate from the second stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, it takes about three minutes after we get on orbit, um, and we just wait for the vehicle to cancel out any rates, essentially make sure everything's nice and stable before the two spacecraft separate. Uh, we should get a great view from the second stage of Dragon's trunk as it flies free. Uh, once Dragon is a short distance away, it starts going into a number of checkouts immediately, uh, looking at some of those Draco maneuvering thrusters. Uh, there's 12 around the service section of Dragon. Those are the first ones that get checked out. Um, they'll also increase that separation distance from Falcon 9 second stage. Uh, these are not the Super Dracos. Those are disabled as soon as we hit this point on orbit. They're only used in an abort scenario. Once we're in outer space, those are disabled for the remainder of the mission. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take a roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, and that exposes its guidance navigation controls, or GNC, that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. 
And once that nose cone's deployed, the remaining four Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead get checked out. And from there, it's about 16 hours for Dragon to go through the rendezvous and approach phases, undergoing a number of what's called phasing burns as it makes its way to the station, just essentially raising its orbit and chasing down the orbiting lab. Stage two, cryo-helium loading. And so all of that's going to be coming up soon. Let's check back in with Chelsea over at Mission Control Houston. Chelsea. Hey, thanks, Dan. Flight controllers here in Mission Control are laser focused on the onboard systems of the space station, making sure it's ready to receive the Dragon vehicle later tonight. They'll also be making sure that all communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly. The consensus is that everything is proceeding nominally. Uh, teams here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the space station will monitor the autonomous docking of the Dragon spacecraft tonight. They'll perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches both on the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place about an hour and a half after docking. Once on board, the astronauts will be greeted by Space Station Commander Tom Marshburn, and the whole Space Station crew will join in for welcoming remarks to the new crew members. From there on out, they will no longer be referred to as Crew 4, as we're calling them today, but rather flight engineers of the International Space Station. Here in Mission Control, Flight Director Anthony Varia is on console overseeing the team for launch, and Adi Bulos will be on console for docking but we'll be on air continuously through Crew 4's arrival. But launch coverage of docking is expected around 8.15 p.m. Eastern. And that's it for Mission Control. I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, I'm excited for launch. How's it looking? All right, thank you, Chelsea, and so are we. We're looking great weather-wise here. Range is green, weather is green, and well, we're green. Green <laughs> and ready to go for this launch. Uh, we are just T-minus 23 minutes and counting uh, from the launch of Crew 4 the fourth astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. And it's going to be a good one, folks. The four astronauts are strapped in, Commander Chell Lindgren, Pilot Bob Hines, and Mission Specialist Jessica Watkins and Samantha Christopheretti. They are strapped into their seats inside Crew Dragon Freedom. And we can see a live shot of their rocket as we look uh, to the screen right now. That is the Falcon 9 the rocket fueling operation is well underway. The launch escape system is armed, and that means Crew Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 rocket in case of an emergency on the pad or even after liftoff. So far, operations look and sound as expected. We are counting down to that liftoff at 3.52 and 55 seconds in the morning, Eastern Daylight Time. And so far, Everything has looked right on. It has. It's wonderful to see just 22 minutes and 32 seconds remaining on the clock. I'm starting to get really excited. When you were sitting inside that spacecraft, how did you feel? Well, at that point, you are really focused. You are, um, you've sort of stopped with the chit chat and the storytelling, and you are very much watching the progress of the propellant loading, knowing that the uh, the time is counting down, and you're just really starting to get, um, you know, get your head in the game and be ready for what's happening next. That's a very serious part of the uh, countdown: is that propellant flowing in? You can see those systems as you're looking on your screen and monitoring them. The mission is the continuation of rotational crew flights to the International Space Station from U.S. soil on private rockets and spacecraft. And this would not be possible without the success of NASA SpaceX Demo 2, a test flight uh, two years ago, if you can believe it, uh, the safe delivery and return of uh, crews one and two, and of course, crew two back on Earth six months ago. And that's why we have with us the pilot from crew two, Megan MacArthur, appreciate you being here. Absolutely. It's hard to believe it. I've been home for six months already and launched almost a year ago. But it time was the time travels. Flying. Yeah, it keeps moving. It was six months that you were up in space. Do you notice that you were in space? Like now, do, do, have you the symptoms of having been up in space for that long completely passed? Or? Um, I would say they 90% back to Earth normal. Um, and, you know, there's some lingering things like back pain and, you know, some joint pain and things like that that will pop up that, uh, you know, I go, well, am I just older now or <laughs> is Earth just harder? Um, so, but for the most part, back to normal. Very good. Well, you've done a wonderful job for us tonight and we appreciate it.
as we continue to count down, we're uh, looking for the next call out, which should be stage two RP1 load complete. It'll be followed by strong back chill has begun, and then we'll start loading stage two with liquid oxygen. Stage two RP1 load is complete. You can see the condensation coming off the rocket, that super chilled locks, chilling down everything, including the skin of the rocket, so that it condenses the humid Florida air. And you see there the clouds are coming off, but at the very top, it's also venting. T minus 19 minutes, 40 seconds in counting. It's an impressive sight. I forget that I can also look over my shoulder and see it uh, in real life. In fact, you just did that. We can't see you on camera, but <laughs> Megan turned and wanted to see that it was the same thing she's looking at on screen. And indeed it is. <laughs> we are bringing you live pictures of the launch of Crew-4 from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Liftoff time, 3.52 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. If you're just joining us, we want to tell you a little bit about the crew on board. Dr. Chell Lindgren is the commander. He was born in Taipei, Taiwan, but spent most of his childhood overseas in England. He is married with three children. He was an instructor and jump master with the U.S. Air Force Academy, and he also has a doctorate in medicine. He served as a NASA flight surgeon and then as an astronaut aboard Soyuz, where he spent 141 days in space during Expedition 44 and 45. And as I mentioned, today he is the commander of Crew Dragon. Sitting next to him is his pilot, Bob Hines, who was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina. There he is. He's married with three daughters. He has a Master of Science degree in Aerospace Engineering and served 21 years in the U.S. Air Force as a test pilot and as a fighter pilot in the F-15E. He came to NASA as a research pilot, but today he's the Crew 4 pilot for Crew Dragon Freedom. A fine commander and pilot, you understand the role of pilot very well. You served it in crew two. That's right. Um, the pilot's role is largely to help the commander keep track of what's going on with the systems, any off nominal conditions, um, while the pilot is monitoring where the vehicle is and where it's going. So you work very closely together. Jessica Watkins is one of our two mission specialists, and she considers Lafayette, Colorado, her hometown. Her college rugby team won the national championship in 2008. She's a geologist who completed several internships with NASA, including one testing system designs for the Mars Perseverance rover. She became an astronaut in 2017, one of the many turtles uh, that are going around here at the uh, NASA astronaut uh, crew team. Uh, she's going up into space for the very first time as a mission specialist. The second mission specialist is Samantha Cristoforetti. She was born in Milan, Italy. She has two children. She's a fighter pilot. And in 2013, Christopher Reddy launched into a space, uh, into space aboard a Soyuz for a long duration space flight to the International Space Station. Several years later, she was awarded the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of Merit from the President of Italy. And today she returns to space with crew four, two fine mission specialists. Now, each of these four crew members will be a part of Expedition 67 once they arrive at the International Space Station. If you are here locally and watching this broadcast and want to step stage away from the screen... Stage 2 lock load has begun. Just heard the call out for Stage 2 prop load. As I was mentioning, if you're listening to uh, the radio, you can find the launch coverage on the frequencies you see at the bottom of your screen, VH radio frequency 146.940 on the megahertz scale, and UH ra UHF radio at 444.925 in the FM mode on the megahertz scale. All of that can be seen, or I'm sorry, heard rather, here on the Space Coast. Megan, let's talk a little bit about your science. Your team 
spent 199 days in space, a record, you call it 200, <laughs> a SpaceX record for an entire crew of astronauts. With all that time spent on board Space Station, can you explain how Space Station acts as that orbiting laboratory where Crew 4 is heading right now? Absolutely. So Space Station is obviously a very unique environment, right? It's long-term access to micro-G environment that scientists can't have, can't repl replicate or simulate accurately here on Earth. So it's the ability to run these experiments that teach us fundamental things about the, about the physics of fluid mechanics, about combustion, things that we can't, again, replicate on Earth that can lead to discoveries um, that can benefit us in space, but can also benefit us back on Earth, like um, understanding diseases well enough to create new treatments for them or understanding combustion in a new way to allow us to build cleaner burning engines. You mentioned some of the science that you've worked on. What was your uh, the most impressive and stands out to you in your mind? Um, well, it's hard to choose a favorite, mm -hmm. but of course one that uh, is always popular is one you get to eat. So we got to um, participate in the Plant Habitat 4 experiment where we grew chili peppers that uh, hailed from Hatch, uh, New Mexico. And so we got to monitor them over a period of many months. It was a, a fruiting plant that took a long time to germinate and to fruit. And for long duration missions will provide a, an important um, vitamin C and other um, minerals for, for crews on long duration missions and uh, they were also just really tasty, so that was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's a bonus. <laughs> and, you know, growing plants in space is part of deeper space exploration, especially growing them in mass amounts, right, so that you can feed a crew. Absolutely right. It'll be an important part of those future missions. Crew 4 will fly aboard a brand-new Dragon capsule, by the way, that the astronauts named Freedom. But the uh, booster has flown three previous times, and there you can see it there with a the sooty covered NASA meatball right above them. That's crew four below uh, standing next to their booster. This flight will be the fourth for that booster, which is a first for NASA and ESA astronauts. Now at the time that that booster lights and takes that crew into space, the International Space Station will be 260 uh, miles over Western Romania. We talked a little bit earlier about chasing down station. Well, when this thing lights, Crew 4 will then spend the next 16 hours chasing down the International Space Station for a rendezvous at 8.15 this evening. And there's a special guest there. That is an uh. Apollo astronaut, Harrison Schmidt. He is a moonwalker, you may recall. Very One cool. of the 12 men who walked on the moon, he launched on the night of December 7th, 1972, from the same launch pad we're using tonight, pad 39A, and then three days later, Schmidt and Commander Gene Cernan landed on the moon. What an honor to have him watching tonight. He, a geologist, watching another geologist, uh, Jessica Watkins, going up to space today, so they share that. And Harrison Schmidt, one of the four surviving uh, astronauts who walked on the moon. Buzz Aldrin, David Scott, Charlie Duke, and Harrison Schmidt, and they are a national treasure. Megan, we are T minus 12 minutes and counting some final thoughts as we get ready to light this candle for, by the way, Samantha Christopheretti's birthday was yesterday. Yes. What a, what a big birthday <laughs> candle. That's right, it's a pretty, pretty good uh, birthday celebration, I think. She's gonna enjoy that. Um, but what will they experience the moment of liftoff? The moment of liftoff is really, it's hard to describe. I've heard it described as lots of different things, a kick in the pants, uh, someone hits your chair with a baseball bat. It's almost indescribable because you start moving so fast and you're accelerating so fast the whole time that it is, it's just a, a sensory overload. You're really, really moving fast. And uh, on our crew, people enjoyed that very much. There was a lot of hooting and, and laughing basically in response to that. And uh, as, the, as the rocket changes its speed, it accelerates down and then back up again. Um, you feel all of that and it really is, it's a tremendous ride. Astronauts from Crew 4 getting ready to experience that. We're about to watch this launch. So with T minus 11 minutes and 25 seconds, let's toss it to Andy at SpaceX in California. Daryl, Megan, thank you so much. It's getting more and more exciting here as we are just about 11 minutes until liftoff. Uh, things are still looking great for both uh, Falcon 9 and Dragon. Falcon 9 began loading propellants at the T-minus 35-minute mark. Uh, we should finish around the T-minus 2-minute uh, mark. Um, right now, densified liquid oxygen is loading and continuing on the first stage. And um, again, this is going to wrap up around the T-minus 2-minute mark. 
The Dragon mission director and team are reporting no issues. Communication checkouts are complete. The crew access arm is retracted. The launch escape system is armed and the crew is strapped in and ready to go. Final instructions to the crew come in at the T minus 10 minute mark. The crew displays will be configured for launch. The setup gives the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and provides constant update on vehicle health. At T minus five minutes, we'll be in terminal count and the Dragon will transition to internal power. And we'll hear, we'll hear continued call outs on the countdown nets as we get closer and closer to liftoff. Range and weather are both green. Uh, right now, I am joined by Dan. Uh, Dan, uh, when we, after ascent, we're going to hear some call outs for um, different types of abort modes, right? Yeah, that's right. On the way uphill, you'll, you'll hear. Here. SpaceX, please confirm crew displays are configured for launch. Freedom confirmed. Displays are configured for launch. SpaceX copy screw four. And on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, we're honored to have you aboard Dragon Capsule Freedom today. It's been a privilege working together to prepare for this launch of the International Space Station. We wish you a great mission. Good luck. Godspeed. Time to let Freedom fly. And copy SpaceX. We'd like to take this opportunity to extend our thanks to our NASA, SpaceX, international partner teams, and most of all our families for getting us to the threshold of this amazing opportunity to launch to the International Space Station of Kennedy Space Center. A heartfelt thank you to every one of you that made this possible. Now let's let Falcon roar and freedom ring. Okay, so crew displays are configured. The crew just reported they're good to go. They're ready to launch. Saw a couple of fist bumps there. Uh, but yeah, as as you mentioned, we'll hear a couple of different call-outs on the way uphill, a combination letter and a number. You'll hear 1A right at liftoff, and these just correspond to the different abort modes. And there's two for the first stage, and then A through E for the second stage, and these are telling the crew essentially which direction Dragon's going to be pointing when it, when it performs a burn of those Super Draco engines. Also gives you an idea of where they're likely to come down if we have an abort on the way uphill. But you'll hear those throughout the, the flight uphill. You'll, you'll also hear a number of call outs from some of the key positions on the Falcon 9 team, the guidance, navigation, and control officer, and also the prop lead. And we're going to be looking to hear trajectory nominal, propulsion nominal, um, just as we make that flight uphill. It's gonna be about a nine minute trip from ground to orbit. And right now we're just eight minutes away. And we've got a couple more events coming up starting at right around seven minutes, right Andy? Yeah, in about 50 seconds at T minus uh, seven minutes, we're gonna begin engine chill on the first stage engine. Uh, this is where we inject a small amount of super chilled liquid oxygen into the Merlin engine turbo pumps before letting the full flow of locks during ignition. So we do this in order to make sure that we don't uh, uh, shock the, the engines uh, because liquid oxygen is so cold. Um, we actually do the same exact things for the second stage engine. That happens during ascent, but we should hear the call out uh, after liftoff for that as well. And again, uh, that is coming up in about 15 seconds. We should hear the call outs over the nets. One engine chill has started. And that was the call out. So again, uh, a small amount of super chilled liquid oxygen being flowed into the Merlin engine turbo pumps. There was nine Merlin engines on the bottom of the first stage. All right, now we've got a couple more events coming up. Right at about T minus six minutes. So in 40 seconds from now, our next prop load milestone will be complete. We'll have all of the RP-1, the fuel, for stage one fully on board. It's at about 99% right now, so we should hear that any moment. Uh, after that, we'll hear a number of call outs uh, related to the Dragon flight computer. Um, they'll get ready to configure for terminal count and then move stage on to internal one, power. RP1 load is complete. And then we hear the RP1 load is complete, so we got that a little early. So all of the RP1, the Refined kerosene is on board the Falcon 9, both the uh, first stage just completing. We already heard that the second stage completed uh, a short time ago. Coming up, we're going to hear the call out 
for Dragon to transition uh, to configure for terminal count and then transition over to internal power. And then we'll hear the propellant tanks on Falcon 9 getting ready to pressurize, adding some additional rigidity and structural support as we get ready for the strong back to retract. It'll move just a couple of degrees at first, and then we'll see it swing open completely uh, at the moment of liftoff. And that strong back uh, providing access to Falcon 9, it's also providing all of the fueling lines and billicles. Uh, for both prop load and all the different gases being loaded on board uh, the vehicle. So those are coming up. We're going to continue to check through a couple more fueling milestones as well. The final one we're going to hear is at just two minutes before flight when we get the liquid oxygen finished on board that second stage. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. Falcon 9 tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. So All right. that, that call out so, that we just heard, um, Falcon 9 is beginning to pressurize for the strong back retract. So if you look closely on the left-hand side of your screen, or excuse me, the left-hand side of the vehicle, there is a large truss structure. That is the strong back. We have some clamp arms uh, just at the bottom of Dragon. Uh, in about... Retract sequence has started. Stand by for kilo arm Well, right now, the... Uh, those clamp arms are beginning to open up. You can see them right behind um, all of the, the, um, the white clouds uh, around the vehicle. Once that is fully open, then the strong back structure will retract away to its pre-launch position about two degrees away from the vehicle. Um, and as we get closer to D0, it will continue to recline back to make room for Falcon 9 and Dragon uh, to lift off and clear the launch pad. So here's a great shot of those clamp arms at the bottom of the screen opening wide open um, and we should see that structure to the right of Falcon 9 and Dragon begin to recline away from the vehicles. This whole sequence takes um, about a minute, a little over a minute uh, to fully complete and we expect this to complete um, in about 15 minutes. Uh, 15 seconds. So you can see on screen that strong back is beginning to recline away from Dragon and Falcon 9. All right, now coming up next is going to be the finish of loading that liquid oxygen on the stage one. We finish up on the liquid oxygen. Stage one locks load is complete. There we go. All of the oxidizer are loaded on to stage one. Yep, and uh, in about a minute here, we should hear the last call out related to propellant. That's going to be stage two, locks load complete. And again, that is the last of propellant loading on Dragon the vehicle. Dragon is in terminal count and on internal power. And as we wait for that call out, all of the white clouds that you're seeing on screen, that is normal and expected for us at this stage in the countdown. We'll continue to see them build up as we get closer and closer to D0. We, we want to make sure that we are keeping the tanks as full as possible um, and the warm uh, uh, ambient air of Florida is um, you know, uh, helping to create those clouds around the vehicle. Coming up on two minutes until liftoff, standing by for stage two locks load being completed. Stage two locks load is complete. Dragon is in auto idle. All right, Dragon's flight computer and auto idle. Next, it'll flip yes, over to countdown. Gas closeout has started, so we're now isolating all of the feed lines for the different gas systems uh, from the Falcon 9 rocket. They're going to then get vented. You can hear that venting start. They're going to get vented overboard uh, through the through umbilicals and through the strong back itself. Coming up at T minus one minute, we're going to hear Dragon is in countdown. It's a flight computer will switch to countdown mode. We'll also hear that the flight termination system on Falcon 9 is armed. Falcon 9 will move into startup and take over control. FTS is armed. Falcon 9 is in startup and is now controlling.
Dragon is in countdown. Dragon's flight computer in countdown. The FTS, that flight termination system on. Brito, SpaceX, go for crew four launch. Freedom is go for launch. SpaceX reports go. Crew reports go. 30 seconds. You heard it there. 30 seconds away from liftoff. T minus 20. T minus 15 seconds. So we've passed the speed of sound. We're already Stage max five. Q. And there's our call out for max Q. Stage one throttle up. So right after max Q, we will begin to throttle Stage those engines up again. Copy one Bravo. And one Bravo. So we're in the second and final abort mode for the first stage. Continuing to get good performance, though. The crew already pulling in excess of two Gs. And coming up next is going to be a couple of events in rapid succession. Yep, in about 10 seconds here, we're going to be performing engine chill on the second stage MVAC engine. Um, and then in about a minute, uh, we're going to start off with MECO, also known as main engine cutoff. This is where those nine engines that you're seeing uh, ignite on, uh, being lit up on screen, those are going to cut off uh, in preparation for stage separation where the first and second stages will separate from one another and then the single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite and continue to carry our crew four astronauts to orbit. And we heard that MVAC chill has started. Stage one throttle down. The nine Merlin engines starting to throttle down. Standing by for Miko. And Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Right. So Miko, stage separation is confirmed. And uh, we see that Copy second stage alpha. engine light. We're in two alpha, the second of board mode. The second stage is lit continuing to carry the crew four astronauts onto orbit. Uh, and this is a fantastic view on the left hand side. This is the first stage now separated from the second stage, but it's still being illuminated by that single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, so right now the first stage is making its way back to Earth to attempt its fourth landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. Uh, the crew is on the opposite, opposite side of the engine that you see on the right-hand side of the screen. They are continuing with their journey to outer space. Seeing good performance on that lone Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage. The crew's G-load dips right when we hit that separation event. And it's going to continue to build up now. Shared acquisition of signal Bermuda. That means we're Dragon, now... SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Freedom copies, nominal trajectory. That was our guidance, navigation, and control officer. Nominal trajectory. Dragon's pointed in the right direction, continuing its flight to orbit. 
We heard Bermuda called out. That's one of the ground stations now receiving telemetry from the Dragon as it continues its path uphill. So we'll, be, we'll have the dueling boxes here for a while as the first stage makes its way down. That second stage going to continue firing until about uh, a little over eight minutes into the flight. Doing the heavy lifting now. The first stage has um, a couple of events itself in order to, to land on a drone ship. So uh, at T plus seven minutes and 25 seconds, it's going to start its entry burn. It's going to be one of two burns. Uh, this is where three of the nine Merlin Dragon engines SpaceX, nominal trajectory. on the first stage will relight uh, and burn for about 30 seconds in order to slow the vehicle down before hitting the denser parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Acquisition of signal, New Hampshire. All right, now on the New Hampshire ground station, another call out there from our guidance, navigation, and control officer, nominal trajectory. Second stage, stage continues to power. Normal. Call out just then, propulsion is nominal, the engine performing as expected. Crew pulling a little more than one and a quarter Gs right now. Again, that's going to continue to ramp up, peaking just before we get to that second stage cutoff. Yep, this, this, this single engine here, Dan, can produce over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space, so um, they are definitely feeling it. And we're already about 200 kilometers in altitude. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Freedom of copies, nominal trajectory. Great call out, that. Uh, we are headed in the direction that we need to, and we, we just heard from Shell, the commander. And we should get one more of those trajectory check-ins in about 30 seconds from now, and then we'll start to hit our events in rapid succession as the first stage continues to make its way back home. And the second stage will start to wrap up its job of delivering these astronauts into orbit. Yeah, we don't see it on screen right now, but the first stage is making its way back to our drone ship uh, in about... Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. In about 30 seconds here, it's going to start its entry burn. And there was the other call out that uh, you, you were mentioning, Dan, about the trajectory. Things, again, continuing to look very, very good for the ascent portion. just joining us we are just under eight minutes into flight we have four astronauts as part of the crew for operational mission you can see on the left hand side this is our first stage with three of nine merlin engines reignited and slowing down the first stage before we hit the denser parts of the earth's atmosphere so this first stage has one stage more one burn left burn shut down. that's going to happen just before the T plus nine minute mark, and then we'll attempt a landing for the fourth time on a drone ship that's currently parked in the Atlantic Ocean. So is that entry burn completes? Terminal guidance. We're in the final stages of the second stages flight into orbit. We're about to pass through several of the different abort phases which essentially correspond to areas along the very northeastern seaboard of the U.S. and then across the Atlantic and off the coast of Scotland. But continuing to get call-outs that Stage 2 propulsion is nominal. Copy, Shannon. And the call-out of Shannon, Ireland, that's... Uh, Stage 1 transonic. Indicative of our final abort zone. And after this uh, second stage engine shuts off its engine, we are going to be listening for the confirmation of a good orbit, which tells us that the if crew and Dragon are where they need to be in stage orbit. Landing burn. 
Dragon, SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. And that was the call that we wanted on the second stage. Here's a fantastic hey, view. We're glad to be in orbit. Of the Dragon, first stage. SpaceX launch escape system is disarmed. Fantastic view of the first stage. Deployed. Landing legs have been deployed, returning back to Earth for a fourth time. And just like that, a fourth landing as part of the Crew 4 mission. You can hear the applause behind us. But prior to this, acquisition signal, Newfoundland. We saw the crew, we heard that the crew uh, has been successfully inserted into a good orbit, and this is them uh, in zero G, uh, yeah. two of them for the first time. And getting a look, it looks like we might have a couple of zero G indicators. I see a turtle in Bob Hines's hands. That is the nickname for the astronaut class from 2017, of which he and Jessica Watkins were a part. I believe we've got a monkey floating over by Samantha Christopheretti. <laughs> but first, first view of Crew 4 on orbit, experiencing microgravity. They're still attached to that second stage, which at this point is going to continue to coast for a couple of minutes. It's got small reaction control thrusters on the upper part of the second stage that can be used to cancel out rates, essentially making sure that they're on a stable coast before we get to that separation event, after which we'll see Dragon Freedom flying free for the first time. We've got, yeah, a couple of stowaways. The, the turtle class really does seem to be taken over now uh, with a turtle zero G indicator. All right, we should be just about a minute away from that separation, after which a number of activation uh, checkouts occur automatically, first checking out 12 of those Draco maneuvering thrusters uh, all around the service section of the Dragon capsule. Uh, we'll also uh, start to get ready for the nose cone opening, uh, which it stays closed for the, the flight uphill to help protect uh, all of those guidance, navigation, and control sensors. It's also covering four of the Draco thrusters that we're going to be using for uh, providing the majority of the thrust, the push, uh, for these different phasing burns as Dragon chases down the space station. But All right, standing by for separation. So typically we'll get a shot from the second stage looking at the unpressurized service section of the Dragon. What a magnificent view. And looking like a good separation, good rates. Dragon freedom flying free for the very first time. So again, now those, those Draco checkouts are starting. Pretty shortly, we'll get to the nose cone deploy, and that's that's when they'll start to open up hooks that are holding the nose cone in place. And it sounds like that has begun. And expect the loss of signal in New Hampshire. So though the crew, uh, as we see them here inside Dragon, uh, they have separated from the second stage, but uh, they still have about a 16-hour journey before making it to the International Space Station and docking tomorrow, or today, later on today. Um, but it is so great to see them uh, flying free in space. They do, and we did get confirmation that that nose cone deploy sequence has started. So again, those six hooks that hold the nose cone in place during uh, the launch and ascent portions have to retract, and then the nose cone will be able to start to swing open and deploy. And that will 
uh, uncover a number of critical systems for Dragon's Flight up to the space station, uh, not the least of which Freedom. the... LD, I hope you enjoyed your ride. It's been an honor flying with you, Chell, Farmer, Samantha, Jessica. Have a safe journey to the space station. Say hi to Crew 3 for us, and we'll look forward to seeing you when you get home. Indeed, the dream is alive. Have some words from our CE. Dragon, CE, privilege having you fly with us. Good mission. We'll see you later. And uh, from uh, Freedom, we want to thank a uh, big thank you to SpaceX, the commercial crew program, and specifically the Falcon 9 team for uh, a great ride. It is a privilege to get to fly this new vehicle, the Crew Dragon Freedom to Orbit. Huge thanks to the teams that assembled and prepared her for flight. We're feeling great and looking forward to the view. All right, so some congratulatory words from the launch director and the chief. Chief Engineer, up to the crew, on board Freedom. Chell radioing down their thanks uh, for the smooth ride to orbit. So, as Andy said, we've got about 16 hours. And Freedom, SpaceX can confirm nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Okay, Freedom copies uh, equals activation complete. We're going to go visors up. And that call from the core here in Hawthorne. Core copies, here we go. Indicating that we had good checkouts of those 12 Draco thrusters around the service section. There's four to go after we get the nose cone open and the ECLIS, the environmental control and life support system activated and running inside Dragon. The crew will be able to get their visors open and pretty soon get out of their suits and settle in for a 16 hour ride to the space station. So with Crew-4 now successfully on orbit. Let's head over to our counterparts at the Kennedy Space Center. It looked great on TV. I'm sure it was even better in person. Daryl, Megan, how are things over there on the ground? Well, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, you're absolutely right. It was phenomenal here at the Kennedy Space Center watching the launch of uh, Crew-4. Wow, Megan MacArthur, NASA astronaut, pilot for Crew-2, and she's been on the space shuttle. You got to watch that launch, and I saw you taking it in. It was spectacular. It really was wonderful to see a launch up close again, um, a night launch, which has been a while since I've seen one in person. Just spectacular. Um, it really, it never, never gets old. I think if it gets old, you're probably in the wrong business. <laughs> Absolutely. It was so loud, so powerful. Um, the roar of the engines when it lifted off, it, it seemed louder than, than usual, but that just <laughs> might be because of the atmospherics. And then that light off the water, what a beautiful sight. Not only were we watching, but also crew on station tuned in to the NASA TV broadcast, watching them lift off as they await for them to arrive tonight at 8.15. That's right. I know they're excited for lots of reasons. One, they're going to get to see their friends, uh, and they're going to get to come home themselves. So they're looking forward to it. All right. Well, Megan, thank you for your thoughts on that. And we also have a very special guest who watched the launch with us here at the Kennedy Space Center. Let's get over to Megan Cruz, who is with one of the astronauts who walked on the moon almost 50 years ago. Megan? Yeah, I am really honored to be standing next to Apollo astronaut Harrison Schmidt. I really cannot believe I'm standing next to you. It really is an honor. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm happy I'm here. Oh, well, we're, we're so thrilled to have you here. And actually, we're going to pull up some old photos of you. Why don't we take a trip down okay. memory lane? Hey, why not? <laughs> so for those who don't know, Harrison was the last person to step on the moon with Apollo 17 in 1972. What picture are we looking at right here? Well, this is the crew, uh, Ron Evans, uh, Gene Cernan, myself. Uh, this is sort of the publicity shot with the lunar <laughs> rover. We were the th uh, third mission to have a lunar rover uh, that we drove around on the surface of the moon. We actually landed in a valley deeper than the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And, uh, and the rover enabled us to visit both sides of the valley and uh, really just had a, not only a great time, but a uh, tremendous scientific return. How does it feel to look back on these pictures? There's you on the moon there. To look back on these yeah. pictures and to be standing here 50 years later <laughs> and you just watched Crew 4 launch. Well, of course, I'm happy to be standing here 50 years later. <laughs> Good and, point. <laughs> and the, uh, the uh, launch uh, of uh, the Falcon 9 and the Dragon 
to the International Space Station was spectacular. Uh, yeah. It, uh, uh, you know, those of us that rode a Saturn V into into space, you know, are a little bit jaded about about the smaller rockets, but uh, still, uh, it really was something. And it, and on board was a geologist, yes. Jess, Jessica Watkins. Yes, you got your special invite today from Jessica. I Jessica, mean, what do you think about invite? that? That's great, Jessica. And I worked a little bit in uh, Houston with the lunar samples and the like uh, during the Apollo. Uh, 11 celebration, uh, 50th anniversary celebration, and she was very kind enough to invite me and my wife here, my wife Teresa Fitzgibbon, and they, uh, uh, we sort of consider ourselves the uh, the Jessica team. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Just what do you think about the fact that there is a geologist on board, the importance of having a geologist for this mission? Well, for, for me, I did not have a chance to gain the kind of operational experience that Jessica is getting. Uh, to uh, uh, I gained my operational experience from f learning to fly T-38s and helicopters and then a lot of simulator time. Uh, she's gaining it in, in space and that's very important. Yeah. And uh, you know I hope it'll stand us in good stead for being part of one of the Artemis crews that goes to the moon. Yeah, absolutely. Artemis, let's talk about that. That's going to return us to the moon. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's crazy. It, it, it's been a long time. There have been several attempts. Uh, uh, to get us back there, uh, the uh, the two Bush presidents both tried to get something going and, and it didn't uh, materialize. But maybe Artemis is the the third time's a charm. Yeah. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Believe yeah. me. Do you think we're ready to go back to the moon? We need to go back to. Oh, the moon? I think we've been ready for a long time. The technology is there. The big difference is NASA had to develop the technology for. Uh, Apollo, uh, advance old technologies as well as new technologies. The thing that's changed is the commercial sector yeah. has moved, taken the NASA technologies to move forward, and now NASA has to integrate that into a new lunar program such mm -hmm. as Artemis. And you saw that tonight with the Falcon 9 launch. That was uh, developed by the SpaceX Corporation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a, turned out to be an extraordinarily reliable vehicle for. Uh, launches in general, and in particular now the fourth launch to the International Space Station. Yeah. Well, like you said, I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that you will uh, that you witness Crew Four, and then also that you'll see Artemis launch soon. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's great, and my best to everyone in NASA, and keep doing great work. Perfect. Thank you so much. Back to you guys. All right. Thank you, Megan, and thank you to Moonwalker Harrison Schmidt. Boy. Uh, for na astronaut Jessica Watkins to have a moonwalker on your team is a pretty nice thing. That's pretty great, yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. Well, we're joined now by Josef Oschbacher, Director General of the European Space Agency, who just watched his first crew launch uh, just a few moments ago. Josef, thanks for being here, and what would you think? Oh, thank you, Daryl. It's just a fascinating moment. This is my first uh, crew launch. Uh, I've been Director General only since one year, so this is really a good experience. I have to say this is uh, phenomenal. But let me also say a word of uh, thank you to, to NASA. NASA is uh, an enormously good partner to us, uh, the European Space Agency. It's really a pleasure working with NASA. We have very good relationships, a very strong partnership. But also thank you to SpaceX uh, for delivering our astronaut, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, up uh, into the space station. And this is, uh, is, is a very important moment. But for us also at the European Space Agency, we are uh, building up a, a strong human exploration program, and uh, Samantha is the third astronaut now in a row, uh, following uh, Doma Pesquet, Matthias Maurer, who is in space right now, and now joined by Samantha. So a year and a half of uh, presence uh, of uh, ESA astronauts in the space station is the longest time ever, and therefore for us this is really a very important moment, and I'm very excited personally, but uh, thrilled uh, to see what's coming. Samantha will have a lot of work to do, a lot of experiments. Uh, she is also a very good role model for us uh, in Europe, but worldwide, uh, lady. And uh, this is uh, also on top of all the, the other qualities she has. So really excited. And uh, once more, thank you, NASA. Thank you, SpaceX, for doing this fantastic job with us together. And we appreciate all the work that ESA does as well for uh, the NASA team and for commercial crew. And you can see, uh, Samantha, she's on the far right-hand side. Actually, you can see her boot there as uh, she goes up into space. And a quick operational update. We have deployed the nose cone from the front of Dragon. That's an uh, important milestone in order for Dragon to dock to the International Space Station. So uh, we passed that milestone, and the crew continues, as you can see there, uh, on their flight through space. You, man you mentioned Samantha Christopheretti. 
Um, she was speaking the other day in a press conference. Not sure if she's going to get to do an EVA. It's possible. But uh, one of the exciting technologies that you have up there right now is uh, the European uh, arm that's on board. Uh, this will be over on the, the Russian segment, but I'm fascinated by this arm, which like has hands on two ends and like crawls around on, on the station. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. Yeah. In, t in fact, we launched it uh, last year. And it's really neat. It's uh, it has uh, you know you can really move it any any way you want. And uh, this is uh, it has to be commissioned. This uh, ERA it's called, uh, and uh, it is on the program of Samantha's uh, tasks uh, among many uh, to commission to support the commissioning of this ERA. And this is something that uh, is quite a unique piece of uh, of hardware. Uh, talking of Samantha. Uh, it's probably uh, not everyone knows, but yesterday was her birthday, yes, and uh, today she flies up on space, so it's a nice birthday <laughs> gift uh, to her to get into a rocket and up to the space station. Uh, happy birthday, Samantha. It's a big we birthday a, candle. That's right. <laughs> we lit a big birthday that's candle right. for Samantha. Um, what is uh, happening next for ESA? You know, you mentioned today uh, that budgets are on the top of everybody's mind. You've got the member states. Uh, that are going to be seeking uh, to fund. You're going to be looking for funding from them. Um, what's next for you, the big, next big thing for ESA? I mean, uh, I'm being here now at, uh, at Cape uh, at Kennedy Space Center. This is actually not my day job. My day job is uh, talking to politicians, uh, to my member states, uh, and really put the program together uh, for the next uh, three years. Uh, and we're having a very ambitious program we are putting together. Certainly, exploration is a priority. Uh, we yesterday had a very nice, uh, very constructive meeting with the administrator of NASA, Bill Nelson, and his team. Uh, we have many projects in the pipeline where we are working together already, and uh, we want to intensify and come with more activities. Let me, of course, mention the space station, where we uh, continue the operational uh, supply of uh, of our activities, uh, the um, our hardware partners, which are then in exchange giving us uh, flights of astronauts. So this is uh, nominally proceeding despite all the discussions you sometimes hear in the, in the news. Uh, then, uh, of course, on Mars Sample Return, uh, we are preparing together with NASA our contribution to Mars Sample Return. Uh, we are also planning missions to the moon. Uh, we have a, a large uh, lander uh, which we are preparing in Europe, which would be, again, a part of contribution to NASA, again, in exchange for NASA flights. This will be a huge one. It will be a truck, actually going up to the moon, uh, capable of launching or, or transporting about 1.5 tons uh, of mass uh, to the moon, which of course is necessary to build up uh, bases uh, and the various infrastructure which uh, will be required. And we have many other activities uh, where we work very uh, very nicely and very closely with NASA. I should mention also ExoMars. Uh, ExoMars uh, was a mission we did uh, prepare together with Russia uh, until very recently, and through the invasion we cannot continue there, obviously. Uh, the, the rover called Rosalind Franklin rover is ready for launch. Uh, we would have shipped it to Baikonur, uh, but of course now I had to stop, uh, I had to suspend uh, this cooperation, and now I have to find new ways of uh, bringing this uh, really incredibly uh, fa fascinating uh, rover uh, onto the Mars surface. So I'm working now uh, with my member states, obviously, but we're doing industrial studies, and again, uh, NASA has reached out to us, uh, supporting us with uh, expertise on, on how we could uh, bring this rover now uh, to the Mars uh, surface and replacing obviously those components that uh, have been Russian with uh, European ones or possibly uh, with some help of, uh, of, of the US. So we have yet to see that and decisions are being prepared right now. Uh, we have uh, decisions on that uh, in the July time frame. But our big moment of ESA is in November when we come with a big package of uh, next uh, space programs uh, to our member states to fund our activities for the next three years. Well, good luck with that. Good luck with, uh, you know, continuing to work to ExoMars. That was a, a bit of a blow. Um, but your moon stuff, you know, we've got uh, part of your, uh, you know, part of your hardware over there in the VAV right now. And so have you had a chance to go over there and see the SLS rocket? I have seen, of course, the SL, SLS rocket. I've seen it last time in the VAB. I've seen it uh, just the day before yesterday out in the open air. Uh, and uh, I have to say uh, this is uh, this is so impressive. Uh, I'm very proud to be part of the SLS. Uh, you see a little ESA logo under the NASA logo because we provide the ESM, the European Service Module, a very uh, crit element on the critical path. And uh, again, once more, thank you, NASA, for this strong partnership, uh, which we enjoy working with you. All right. Josef Osbacher, Director General of ESA, thank you so much for making time and joining us, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Sir.
All right, well, mentioning the International Space Station, NASA recently announced the International Space Station would be extended another eight years and then decommissioned. The International Space Station, an unparalleled laboratory for cutting edge research unachievable in Earth's gravity for the benefit of all humanity. An observatory for Earth's evolving climate. A beacon of international collaboration. And our home until 2030. As the station enters its third decade, it is busier than ever. Developing technology for human exploration missions to the moon and Mars. Finding new ways to combat disease and acting as a testbed for in-space manufacturing of advanced materials and new medical products. Humanity's future is an ever-expanding team of nations and companies enabling exploration together and for the benefit of all. The International Space Station is a critical step on a great journey ahead to the moon and beyond. Today's launch is the fourth operational mission for NASA's commercial crew program. It has seen many successes in just a few short years. NASA's Megan Cruz is back now with uh, some leadership from our NASA program. Megan. Yeah, I'm here with Dana Hutcherson. She's the deputy manager of NASA's commercial crew program. It is really great to have you here. Thanks for having me. So what did you think of today's launch? It's so exciting. You know, it's, the launches never get old. I'm always excited to get to see a launch and to be up here on the balcony and hear new people yeah. watch the launch. It's always just um, a breath of fresh air to hear that. Yeah. You know, our mission's not done, though, so we're always watching, and I don't breathe a... Um, I don't breathe a sigh of relief until right. we actually land the crew. So, what I thought was really cool, though, is right after a liftoff, pretty shortly after a liftoff, we heard the commander Chell give you guys a shout out, the commercial crew program a shout out. Yeah, exactly. I think that was really awesome. We have a lot of great people that work with, in our program, and a lot of people that spend tireless days working on um, working with them, both SpaceX and NASA, and all of our teams that work together. So, really appreciate that shout out from Chell. Well, is this program, would you say, accomplishing what it set out to do when it was created 11 years ago? Yeah, I do believe it has. I mean, uh, it was cost effective, safe, reliable transportation to low Earth orbit and to the International Space Station. So, yes, I believe we have definitely achieved that goal. And also, working with these commercial companies, building um, multiple commercial systems, spaceflight systems, delivering our astronauts to space. It's, um, it's also opened up the doors for the private industry as exactly. well, and so enabling that space transportation for the public. So it's just, um, we actually had two private missions in the last <laughs> year, right, that SpaceX um, has accomplished. So I think our goals um, in the commercial crew program, we've um, o gone above and beyond on meeting those goals. Yeah, you've really been the springboard into what we can expect to be our, our, our near future, it sounds like, with all these commercial um, programs, like you said. Exactly. It's a new era with NASA in the commercial and human space flight, for yeah. sure. Dana, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. All right. Thank you. Daryl and Megan, back to you. All right, thank you very much, Megan. Jell, Bob, Jessica, and Samantha are now on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 8.15 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time tonight. And NASA TV will stay on the air for continuous live coverage along Crew 4's entire ride to station. Meanwhile, SpaceX's YouTube channel will join live coverage starting roughly two hours prior to docking. And though our coverage here at Kennedy Space Center is concluding, we will turn it over to the team in Houston to take us through the next phases of Crew 4's mission all the way through arrival at the International Space Station. Megan, 
when they arrive at the International Space Station, you were talking about a moment ago, is that, it's, a, it's a big moment. You it, arrived, you finally got there. It is such a big moment. It is sort of the culmination of so much training, not just your mission-specific training, but something that you have been you know, working towards pretty much your whole career. And so it's a fantastic moment to come through the hatch, to see your friends there waiting for you, smiling at you. Um, there's a lot of emotions, just a lot of joy, and uh, you know, you're about to get started on a pretty great adventure. Bob Hines and Jessica Watkins flying for the first time. I wonder what that was like for them. Well, I'm sure they're still talking about it and still processing it, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a lot of things that happen. It happens so quickly that it's it's hard to take it all in, and they'll be talking about it for days to come, I think. But we're going to see great things from them, from all four of them, once they reach the International Space Station. I think uh, big smiles all around, but lots of great work as well. Absolutely, and we look forward to seeing the work that they will do. For those of you watching online on YouTube, uh, make sure you take sure take a look at the description below the video. We'll have a new link for the Crew 4 Coast Phase, and that live coverage will continue at that new location shortly. If you're watching on NASA TV, well, you won't notice a thing, and coverage will continue. Also, a post-launch news conference is scheduled for 5.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on NASA TV. And you can find mission updates at any time on Twitter, at NASA, at SpaceX, and on the web at nasa.gov, including, including the timing on any potential live uh, tours of Dragon Freedom during the trip to the station. Now, before we sign off, I want to thank Megan MacArthur for being on the launch broadcast and sharing your incredible insight and experiences on an overnight <laughs> <laughs> that started yesterday and ran into today. Really appreciate it. You Absolutely. Did a fantastic it job. was totally worth it. Oh, fantastic. It was great, great to hear you say that. And so now we will leave you with a little bit of a replay. And thanks to all of our guests who came here, the NASA social participants uh, who joined us and are now going to share uh, the story of their adventures here with their audiences. And of course, we thank all of you who are watching right now. Um, here are now some highlights from the journey to orbit off the Earth for the Earth. Take care, everyone, and keep looking up. This is the suit up room inside the operations and checkout building at the Kennedy Space Center. And here comes crew four down the hallway. All right. There they there are. There they are. <laughs> Jessica Watkins, Bob Hines, Chell Lindgren, and Samantha Christopheretti. Samantha and Jessica there. Bob Hines and Shell Lindgren. And here come Jessica and Samantha. The closeout crew there appears to have the hatch shut. Pitching down range, all nine Merlin engines have to land.